Everybody and welcome to the very first episode of Gemini Rising, the curious talk show. Joining me is my co-host, Dr. Anne Woolkey and fellow Gemini Rising yes. individual. <laughs> yes. Hello. And our first guest, if you haven't guessed already or if you haven't seen all of the posts on social media, we are in the High Vibe Studios and our very first guest is... David Palmer, the Leo King. What's going on, Gemini <laughs> Risings? <laughs> this Leo Rising can hang, I feel, with your guys' talk show, the I Curious so. Talk Show. I feel At like, least that's what I've kind of helped coin it for the moment. Well, you coined it that because we were having a conversation saying, well, what is this show about? And essentially, the Gemini Risings, we have questions. We always have questions, Yes. <laughs> So this is our one chance to have those questions and maybe not annoy people with them, right? Or are we just asking the questions that everybody else has and they don't have the opportunities to ask the questions? So, right. Because we, when we were talking about doing this show, we talked about the fact that, you know, David is – such an incredible spiritual teacher in so many ways um, and obviously especially the astrologer astrology because he is the celebrity astrologer mm -hmm. he has all of the classes and everything like that teaching so many of us um, how to be better at reading the charts but he has so many other talents um, he reads tarot he is a psychic he is a medium and so I certainly have questions about that yes yeah, we all do. And I think that we were thinking about this show, you know, we, we were inspired by our conversations that we have around the studio, right? We sit here so, so many times and we have these great epiphanies that we find <laughs> out while we're here behind the scenes and we'll always be saying we should have had a show about that. So maybe this show will be that. And I also think the conversations that we have prior to the show, we often say if we had cameras rolling, that's a show. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what we want this to be. We want it to be that kind of conversation. So I guess for me, where I want to start off, David, you've talked a lot about how astrology was always a part of your life, but it kind of developed as you were you know, going through school and you use the astrology early on as a way to talk to the girls and sort of get in there with with, um, with getting the girls to open up a little bit. When did you know that you had psychic and medium, mediumistic abilities? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I mean, I think people have heard through the internet, or, you know, it was AOL for me. That's how I found astrology uh, through teen chat and then I started like dating and so it was like oh gosh you know like what's their signs and like noticing the difference but it, I, I don't I, I knew I was psychic but I didn't know I was psychic like I felt intuition but I didn't even know what to call it so I didn't think of it right I just was like naturally like she ain't gonna call me tonight as I'm sitting, uh, it's like the old school days, right? Where I had the second phone line that my mom got for my brother and I, Ooh. and you know, w you know, waiting for it with like the ringer on one, you know? <laughs> and like I had like the cool kind of Zach Morrissey one, you know? But it was black. 
And like, you know, like I was kind of like, you know, I'd wait and they'd the first ring, hey, I don't want to wake the house up. But I would just like, no, they're not going to call or they are going to call or, you know, I only got catfished once. So most of the time I avoided being catfished, but it was when I went against my intuition, I got catfished where I like waited for this girl, like, you know, on aim for like five years or something. And found, <laughs> and then she finally five admitted years. it to me who she was. And, and it wasn't like I fully waited, you know, but I, I, you know, I was in the back of my Leo like, well, you know, if that chick ever did ask me to go out, for sure I'd go out, you know? But it, it was, she was, she, so it was when I, I knew the whole time all the signs were there and I just didn't want to listen to them. But I would say it was after the military because in the military I followed my gut and it went against the, the norms of like, I, I need to get out of the military and I have to get in the middle of the war. And, and really it was trusting my gut fully for the first time in my life on my own being an 18 to 19 year old and and having going against what my family was advising me jag lawyers guys in the in the navy with me and and when i went to the brig which is military prison i remember the weight off my shoulders you'd think going to prison is like the opposite but for me it was like accomplishment <laughs> i'm finally free even though i'm going into a jail cell and i think it was the day i left uh navcon brig miramar that's the name of it and i finally saw sunlight again and i got to be free and go into the van to take me back to my base to be decommissioned for months that i really was like i, I saw that i saw the sunlight of my life ahead like and, and that's when I got really into the astrology. And that's when I looked at it and was like, holy cow, you know, I'm a zero degree Leo. So at 18, I've got Mars at 18 Scorpio. So my progressed sun squared Mars and I went into the military and then I'm born in, in the 12th house. So my progressed sun, I learned about the 12th house being about prisons, hospitals. So I, I also had a hernia surgery at 18 right after my uh, rescue swimming school. And then I couldn't do rescue swimming anymore. So then I went to F-18. So all the typical 12th house stuff happened. And that's when it just lit up and I started doing charts with Alabe.com. Mm -hmm. And that's where I guess I would say I, I felt, I know I'm intuitive opposed to, I'm intuitive, but I don't know what to call it. And I'm just doing it. Mm -hmm. But when you were a child, um, I think that it was a little bit after you would have been a kid, but there was the movement of thinking about kids being indigo children. Do you remember that? Yeah. Or did anyone ever call you an indigo child? Or did, was no. your mom aware of that? Because I watch now your relationship with your mother, and she's such a big supporter of you and is very um, sensitive to just to you. Like she's a, she, you, you really have a great, resonance together right so to me it seems like when you were a child she must have been aware of your special personality you know or that you had this intuitive side well see that's why gemini risings can help people figure things out right because it's a very my mom knew i was a sensitive i was the shy one mm -hmm. my mom makes a good joke and my brother too my brother was not shy in school or anything, right? And was the skateboarder doing, you know, he was a great, he was, my brother should have been a pro skater. Like he was that good. I mean, I was great in sports. He was great in sports too, right? And I was captain of the water polo team and still shy, you know, in high school. And so, but it flipped my, they never believed I would be who I am now. And on especially reality shows or being kicked out of the military and having the military show up at my house. So my mom, she was reading spiritual books in the, in the early nineties. And I was asking questions like I've always said about, you know, men are from Mars, men are from Venus. Like she had that book and that's when I correlated planets with people. And, and then it, it was just that title that did it. But my mom knew, and my mom always talked more. We, we weren't a religious household, so it was more spiritual talk. And then my dad was very open-minded and quirky Aquarius and fun and, you know, in, in the auto industry. And my dad always believed in like something more mystical or mysterious about the universe. So we would have those kind of talks. 
And my mom really made sure that uh, we were also boys. Like she let us be boys and learn. She's a, she's a Virgo, so she was always a nervous wreck. But, she, you know, I didn't have a household that was very, um, you know, there was not a lot of yelling. There was not a lot of uh, rules that you need to be. It was more like expecting, you know, us to be of good character. And so, and my grandparents on both sides were the same way. So it was not until my grandfather died when I was in boot camp, my mom didn't tell me. Because I guess, as you would say, and she's very aware of my energy and she didn't want to mess me up in boot camp that my, my, my mom's father died, my Opa. And then I found out after I got out of the military that he was an astrologer when I was doing astrology. It was like this big secret. Hmm. And, and it's weird because he had a TV shop and in the back in a warehouse just like this, he was doing astrology. <laughs> So, you know, it, it does have that, I guess I was lucky to have that kind of in my genealogy, but yeah. So um, my mom definitely knew. And I was, I was, I was very aware of like, if the teacher was like, okay, we're reading a book, who's going to raise, I, I don't want to call myself a teacher's pet, but I kind of was more of an intuitively knowing like, oh, nobody's raising their hand. I'll raise my hand. I'll read because everybody can't read. And I like to read stories. So it was like, you know, I, I was able to pick up on all the cues and what my friends were going through. And I actually was in peer mediation. I got asked to be in that really young in the beginning of that program. So I used to help in the high school. If there was a kid that got in a fight with another kid, the cops, before they would take him to juvenile hall, would say, last chance, peer mediation. And so I was doing that kind of work really young. So yeah, I mean, my parents knew, my dad knew too. My dad was very supportive. And, but my mom and I have that extra special, you know, where, where it's been our whole journey of the spiritual journey together and, and able to have those combos and reflect and, and grow in advance, I guess you could say, you know, so. And what would you say, because there's all the different Claire's, do you have all of them or do you have one sense that is stronger than the rest? Hmm. I would, I mean, I, uh, this might, this might be a little weird to put it right. But I would say I, I, I am somebody who believes that astrology is intuitive it can be used as a, as a mathematical hermetic calculative aspect, which I think a lot of people use it as to me, it's I'm an intuitive astrologer. So to me, it was like, I didn't learn astrology. It came to me and found me, but that same energy when it comes to like, when, when I finally understood like human design, like that just came to me or the destiny cards actually came into my life before human design. And that made a lot of sense to me. So I would say it's like an undescribable, we don't have a name for it. We call it intuition or we call it maybe channeling, but I would say it's something different. I would say, you know, it's like a divine um, mission and purpose of your soul mission that once it's found and activated, whatever the tools are, you're going to be the best at all of the tools that you're good at. Like, so I don't think I'm, a better astrologer than I am a tarot reader or a better tarot reader than I am a human design. I feel like I'm the same in all of them because I'm in the same energy into all of them. And it's the same energy that's coming down and through me through it all. So, you know, I, I, I and that's where I don't, I, I kind of don't like to pigeonhole myself. That's why I just call myself the Leo King. Right. You know, I think I am like in a moment of rebranding of just, you know, I think people never understood what celebrity astrologer meant. It meant I'm the astrologer that became a celebrity astrologer, not because I do celebrity readings because I am the celeb. I do them. I've done the most United States television in it. Right. So like that, that was like becoming what, you know, you see in Mexico or you see in other countries where astrologers are, on the news more, or they're like more of a celebrity themselves. America didn't have that. And if you try to say that, that was Susan Miller. It wasn't, you know what I mean? I'm sorry <laughs> no. to say it wasn't, it wasn't Susan Miller. No, I have a confession to make. Sorry. You probably have a question, but I have to say this. 
So I've told this to you before, David. I used to read Susan Miller religiously, religiously. And I, I think it was before I even discovered you. But when I went to do The Bachelor, we obviously, when we were in the house and I was there for two months, we had no access to anything. And I remember sitting there with... I always call them the minders. That wasn't their job, but we had two women that would on rotation live with us for a set number of days and then they would go and swap out. But I remember saying to them, can I please have a computer because I want to read, it's the first of the month, I have to read my astrology. And they went, are you joking? And I said, no. And it was Susan Miller that I read. And in my Facebook memories the other day, it came up that I was annoyed with Susan Miller because she hadn't gotten her report up on time. And I <laughs> laughed so hard when I read that in my memories because I just went, oh, I can think of nothing worse than reading her astrology at the moment. Sorry to any Susan Miller fans. I don't, but I don't even know where did where does she put her astrology? Oh, she's astrology in the New York Times or, oh, mm. okay. So, Okay. But that's just a by the by because it's. Well, if I could just say like the, the thing about it was when I looked at somebody like her, you know, she did some TV stuff, but it was like, eh, it was like boring. Mm. So like for me, it was like in the early, right before 2010, right? Like when I actually all the way back on MTV in 2006, I, after I did parental control in 2005, I did next. And so when I was on the next bus, I was the fourth guy in the bus. So there's five guys and the girl next did the three guys in front of me. So I'm like, and, and I've said this story sometimes, but you know, most, most people laugh, but you know, I was on a lot of drugs. I was on weed. I was, I smoked meth on that bus. It's all in, it's all on the, uh, on a MIC. Like if you look up, uh, next is, was the Tinder, the future of Tinder the article, it's, it's about me. It's crazy. If you go on the internet, it's a huge piece. It's like still to this day, one of the biggest pieces. And I talk about how I got in trouble because in the next bus, they black out all the windows on the RV. And I was a smoker and I smoked weed and I was doing meth at the time when I was young. And I did all that in the, in the, in the bathroom. And I remember being like, <laughs> and I got in a lot of trouble because they started smelling the weed and the cigarettes. I'm like, oh, I was just smoking a cigarette. They're like, we spelled something else. I'm like, well, then let me outside. They're like, you're not allowed to know where you're at. I'm like, I need to smoke. So they let me out. I'm like, well, I guess we're in the Hollywood Hills, like parked along this road, just in the Hollywood Hills. So, but then they're like, yep, yeah, that's all you can know. Like, you know, cause I, I didn't know if I was at the beach. I didn't know, you know, in that show you come out and it's like, I was thinking they were going to have like a beach situation. Like I have to like run through hoops or whatever to impress the girl. But in that one, I'm like, I guess I'm going to go with how it is. And it was a Renaissance theme. Perfect. And so I had to like eat a meal with her old school by her hands. And I wore this whole Renaissance outfit. And she, I asked her, what's your sign? And she was a Libra and I'm a Leo. So I'm like, and she was, she understood astrology. So she was like, oh, I love that. You know? And so she played with it and I fell for it because, you know, on that show, I have the option where if she goes, well, I want to be with you. I either take the date for, for the future or I take the cash. And at that point, the date was like two hours. So it was like $200. So I was like a hundred bucks an hour. But I was like, oh, she's pretty cool. And then it ended up being uh, a celebrity, Brianna Evigan. And she got like best kiss in 2008 on MTV for being in Step Up 2. She was like the Step Up girl. And she was like, yeah, I just did this for some real stuff. And I have a boyfriend. And I remember being like, oh, I just got punked. Like, you know. But I, I remember doing astrology that way and it got out and people recognized me all for a long time. And then when I went on True Beauty, I'm like, I'm going to be the celebrity astrologer. There's no reality TV astrologer that's like a badass on fucking ABC, like living the life and especially in Vegas, that show was. And then taking it to where I did to do all the other talk shows with all the bigger hosts. Like, like you didn't see Susan Miller on Steve Harvey. You didn't see her on, like you didn't get, she didn't get that big. She might've gotten on a, Ooh, on a news network, like I did those too, but like she wasn't on talk shows, like big, 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 like 30 minute things and me helping a girl find love through all those guys and, and working with the producers and stuff. So it was setting a mark and, and, and that's what celebrity astrologer means. And yes, I do tons of celebrities. I do them on T I've done them on TV too, but. Um, I think with Susan Miller, 
she doesn't have the charisma and the ease with which you talk about all these things. That's just my observation. But I know Anne has some incredible questions, but I just want to ask one other question that kind of bookends what we've been talking about. So you're also a medium. When did you discover that you could speak to the other side and were you freaked out the first time you saw something? You know, I I was doing readings in my apartment in Hollywood in 2013. And even the readings I was doing in 2012 and 2011, like it, it would just be like one out of like every hundred or 200 readings. Like I would just be like, who's so-and-so? Why? They would always go, why? And then I'd be like, because usually I, cha- I, I always channel somebody's guides. Like I've always said, maybe one guide comes over their shoulder two guides or a stadium if it's a really gnarly situation of guides or sometimes even more than that or sometimes a an old historical figure like george washington's come a bunch or just like really weird guides have come by but sometimes that guide will be not a guide and it will be a totally different energy it'll be somebody that's come through from the other side and it'll be very on point with what it is and so I would, I never, I never promoted readings for mediumship, but then of course, John Edward found me in 2014 and it was like a really crazy time because I was with some friends that I had met because this one girl, I used to be on Yelp and some girl hit me up and I did a reading for it like three in the morning. And then we became like friends on Facebook and she was super cool from Detroit. And then there was all these friends from Detroit and they came to LA and then they were all in San Diego and we stayed at this hotel that John Edward actually was doing an event at. And we were like, oh, maybe we'll see him in the lobby. Didn't happen. And then my mom was like, cause he did like multiple days. She was like, oh, I went the day before you guys got there, you know, or whatever. And then like a week later, John Edward just was searching or that, day, or that weekend, John Edward was searching for full moon and then he found me found my videos on YouTube and then he hit me up and we talked and then I went to Atlanta to his Evolve, um, you know, network. And it was like a 2,500 person um, theater. And he just was like, you're, you're coming on and you're going to help channel, do your medium and astrology with me. We're going to, we're going to tag team people. And, and, and I remember having almost a panic attack because I had never been in front of 2,500 people. And it was like I just got off the plane, you know, got into the hotel room, met him for the first time, and then we're in the fucking SUV, and the next thing you know, I'm fucking, like, being thrown into that. And it was gnarly because I'm, like, giving birthdays of the person who passed that he's picking up on and then giving messages. And, yeah, it was pretty wild. And... You know, he helped confirm it to me because on the way home, he had told me when we, uh, we were done, he was like, I have to finish the last half of the show. So just sit down. I got you this cool place in the theater. And he goes, just, just pay attention to me and see what kind of energy you feel around me. I'm like, okay. And then we got into the, the SUV after it. And then he goes, what was the energy you saw behind me? And I'm like, this might sound really crazy, but I saw Thor. And that, he had that written down on a piece of paper. Wow. <laughs> and that's how he kind of knew, you know, and he always, he described me on his show as like all my guy just come in and just, he says like, and just blam, you know? So I, I, I respect him a lot for giving me that opportunity with mediumship and astrology and promoting me. And, um, you know, cause like he was somebody I watched when I was a kid crossing over my, there's my mom, man mm-hmm. crossing over. I watched that with my mom. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, and I thought that was a cool show. So, all right, this is, okay, first I want to point out, I have cards because I'll never forget Natalie on the first full disclosure that she did with you <laughs> with the cards. And I thought that seems like the most Gemini rising thing to do, to have like a million <laughs> questions on cards. We didn't get quite a million, but um, I'm actually going off card right now. <laughs> so I hope it'll be okay. Hang on, everyone. Um, 
So you brought up John Edward in 2014, right? That that's when that happened. Yeah. And one of the things that I was thinking about in preparation for this show is how you came along at a really interesting time. So you're not only a Pluto Libra when most of the people you grew up with are probably probably Pluto Scorpio, right? So yes. you're, you're kind of like a little unusual one tossed into their mix, right? Very unusual, yeah. And at the, on the other hand also, you, you started doing astrology at a time after it had been, it's not really discredited, but it had been, there'd been a lot of skeptical groups that came up in the 80s, or in the, I guess, 80s, 90s. But what is really interesting is that I looked back into what was going on when you were a child. So I was trying to think, what influenced him, right? I'm treating you like a historical figure. That's cool. <laughs> so I'm doing the historical context. And I came up with, um, I was looking at, I don't know what it was, astrolo something about astrology, obviously. And it came up with Donald T. Reagan, or Regan, I don't know how you say his last name, the chief of staff for Ronald Reagan. Oh, okay. And he wrote a book in 1988, and that's the book where we all heard about how Nancy had an Joan astrologer. Quigley. Yeah, Joan Quigley. Mm -hmm. And um, that she, you know, I, I read that they say she got that astrologer after the, the assassination attempt. At but the bank, it, outside the bank, yeah. Right, so that she could help prevent future issues, right? And then in the book... They also talk about how, you know, Ronald Reagan always made sure he was on record saying, Nancy, you know, you can have this astrologer, that's fine. People might think you're a little weird, but that's fine. <laughs> but other people say they used astrology for all sorts of things, right? Like he would do his the press Supreme, conferences. His Supreme Court justice pick, she picked the exact moment that was perfect and for him to come and announce it because it was going to shock, of course. It always shocks Congress, right? Especially the Senate. Like, oh, what are you talking? Like, uh, you know, like who, who, who is he picking? Mm -hmm. So she picked that. That was probably the biggest thing she did. But she also would time Air Force One when to land, when to take off, and so it became like where the Secret Service would ask questions, or even his advisors, and his, you know, would be like, are, "Are you really going to follow this?" But then it would work. So then Nancy was the one with Joan Quigley kind of calling those parts of the shots, you mm -hmm. know? And you know, he was an Aquarius, Ronald Reagan. And I always find that really interesting because I'm like, he's such a unique president. He came in after kind of a similar situation of what we're seeing right now in the world. Like the inflation was super high, you know, like Carter was a, a horrible president. Like nobody was happy. Nobody, you know, and, you know, inflation was everywhere. Everybody was like, just, kind of like not feeling like America was going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And he even said the same thing, make America great again. That was, that's what's so funny. I think people for, they, they put that to Trump, but that's actually Reagan. That was his slogan. Mm -hmm. It's the same slogan. Mm -hmm. So it's not a new slogan. Right. And so when they say MAGA Republicans now, I laugh because I'm like, I guess you're upset with the Reagan people. Yeah, they used too? to be Reagan Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, um, it was interesting, though, that in my research, I found out that he actually used an astrologer for his um, his inauguration in California. So he uh, he had been using an astrologer before that, um, but apparently they didn't have one right before that assassination attempt. So in looking at that, I guess my point is that it's really interesting that in the '60s and '70s, and then right up through Ronald Reagan, astrology and spirituality and paranormal things. It was a lot more mainstream than it was by the time you were out doing astrology because of Ronald Reagan. I think it was that book in 1988. And then also before that, there had been this, I can't remember the name of the group, a, oh, the Skepticism Committee for Skeptical Inquiry by Paul Kurtz. He created this committee that went about trying to get, trying to kind of trick people, trying to expose paranormal things or that astrologers mm. weren't um, who they, who they couldn't do predictions. But it's almost like at that point, astrology really changed 
because it really had, it, I mean, it really was part of the public re discourse. I have this really interesting article from the Washington Post from right after Reagan was um, shot. Do you want to hear what it said? Yeah, I'm, yeah. <laughs> How about you, Natalie? Would of you like to hear? Of course I do. Um, so this is an article that I think was written by Sidney Omar because it was whoever was the astrologer for the Washington Post. And it says, last Monday at 2.26 p.m., this is April 5th, 1981, gunfire wounded the president of the United States. It also fit, felled his press secretary, James Brady, a Secret Service agent and a D.C. policeman. As I watched the almost continuous replay of the moment on television, I was at first incredulous and shocked, horrified, enraged, and finally anxiously awaiting with tears and prayers the hospital reports. And yet, as an astrologer, I breathed a sigh of relief, for the other shoe had fallen. The ominous aspect that was dog dogging the charts of Ronald and Nancy Reagan, accentuating the link between the president and the vice president, the ominous aspect that appeared on the charts of the inauguration and of, and of the eclipse of February 4th that fell on Reagan's son had materialized. Once such an aspect materializes, it usually does not reoccur. And if astrology worked, President Reagan was going to be okay. So it goes on to talk about the whole thing. and They probably talked also about the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. Yes. It, 1980, it right, into yeah. 81, because that's, ex that's the curse of Tippecanoe, but that's in astrology, the Jupiter-Saturn on the zero years. Mm -hmm. And I've covered that. We've covered that before. And even, yeah. you know, they always cut it off at like 1840, but, you know, we've gone back to 1800 and been like, oh, that cycle brought in, of course, you know, the whole Aaron Burr, once it got to the next phase or, you know, James Monroe just completely taking over the whole entire electoral votes, you know, uh, of 1820. Um, like, so the, and then, or JFK being the youngest president and then of course being assassinated. Now we have Biden the oldest with the same exact Jupiter Saturn cycle, but it did do a little bit different because it, conjuncted in Aquarius for the first time, like we've been seeing it in Capricorn at 29. So I, I really, I really think that when you're talking about that time period, what influenced me the most actually was that was the big Hubble moment in the eighties that my grandfather, my, my, my father's father was showing me. Cause he was, you know, he was a, an accountant, but he was also a mathematician and he helped he worked at McDonnell Douglas with using their first computers to help accounting, right? So he was, he was part of Scientific America. He was part of all of Scientific Nova with laser discs and showing me the planets. And I got to see out of telescopes, out of our beach house in San Clemente and see the planets and actually see Saturn with my own eyes when I was young. And he taught me about it also. So I didn't go into astrology knowing astrology, I went in knowing astronomy. I like, I already knew the rotations. I already knew those cycles. I already knew what the compounds, the, the different ways that each planet was unique. I knew that these were gas giants that were Jupiter and Neptune. And I understood that Saturn was this gas giant, but it was, it, it had, it was so, I, you know, Saturn always fascinated me the most. I always thought Jupiter was a little weird to me. <laughs> um, but, it, and then Carl Sagan was a big part of that time period as well. So watching him and his idea of you know, putting out the collective unconscious was the reason why I started saying, which you hear people say it now all the time, the collective conscious. Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize that when I started that in 2012, that was not, nobody, people, I got so much backlash. Everybody was like, no, it's collective unconscious. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm switching it to illuminating the collective consciousness. <laughs> and now you hear it said like it's this, if it's been said, but it's because of the 10,000 plus videos I did of every day saying it that put it into the whole spiritual focus. Consciousness. Yeah. And yeah. can I say, I've said this on full disclosure before, when I first found you and you only had a couple of thousand followers on Facebook, all of that, because I, I like people knowing I was one of the first, I used to always say it with you because it was said at the beginning of every single video. And so then I would go out and parrot it to other people. So I like to think I was part of spreading mm -hmm. the collect or bringing the collective consciousness under. together with no idea that we would end up working together. But that phrase, and I don't know how many years you said it for before you kind of 
let it go and moved on. But it certainly got into my head because I listened to it every day. Yeah, and I never really liked, I'll be honest, I didn't like Carl Sagan. I thought he was a piece of crap, personally. Um, I, I thought he was a little too slick willy. Whereas like I liked Arthur C. Clarke, even though technically he was more of a, a producer, more of a imaginative, but he was working with greater ideas of fractal geometry and, and helping with that project of, of, the, of looking at the, the, uh, the uh, what was it? The Mandela set, um, the Mandelbrot set and, and, and working with just so many different scientists about understanding infinity, the colors of infinity. So like those were the things that were really like, to me it was like this more scientific understanding the astronomy was booming in the eighties into the nineties and Hubble, like, you know, seeing the pillars of creation and then how we just saw, you know, with the new James Webb, that picture. And now I'm like, those look like freaking weird lions and weird, you'd see like images of things in them, but it used to look green, you know, and kind of like you could see how they put the pictures together with Hubble and now we're seeing it just like pop like crazy. But the, like that, my grandfather, that was his favorite picture was, was like, look at this is how stars are born, you know? So like that, that was the info I was learning. So, so it was really easy once astrology kind of came in, it was like, I always tell in all my schools, throw away your astrology books, go into astronomy first because then you're going to be in an ace with astrology because now you're going to understand what a geocentric chart is and then heliocentric chart at the same time. And of course there's been this big debate about flat earth and so forth. It's like the helio chart is so perfect to understanding why we have the retrogrades that anybody who's stuck on the flat earth, which I know people are controversial about it, but to be honest, like they don't use the helio and the, and I use it in all my weekly horoscopes since Michael Erlewine taught me it back in 2011. And it's how I've done half my predictions or it's half part of the prediction process. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that, and, and to me, it's like, where, where does the planet go? It just disappears. Like it just goes off the, mm -hmm. it just goes off the, the flat earth. It just kind of has like a little closet that it waits in. <laughs> like I just yeah. I like, like they don't explain that stuff. They just keep looking at the horizon thing and the, the ice wall. And I, I mean, who knows? I, I'm open to all things, but as far as like saying, saying flat earth means that there is no heliocentric, that doesn't make sense to me, especially it's so perfect. And that's what makes the geo chart so perfect. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't take away Ptolemy's amazing work with understanding the planetary rotations and the retrogrades that, that helped us from a geo point of view, because it was later on that we were able to see it from a helio point that was so Proceed. It was so. It's so. It makes it more precise. Right. And I know that Michael Erlewine and I've done many podcasts with him over the years, and even at the last UAC in 2018. And he's frustrated because the astrology community just doesn't want to go into helio. And I, and I understand his, uh, you know, frustration because they're missing out on a completely amazing astrology. Like, like, like I, I remember just doing Pluto that had just ingressed again into Aquarius geo-wise, but it was January 22nd that Pluto ingressed Helio into Aquarius. There's no retrogrades in Helio. So, so most people were missing that part of the puzzle with the Pluto. Mm -hmm. like the, the, like, so like last year, I was like, yeah, this Pluto Aquarius ain't going to do much, mm -hmm. right? Cause, because Pluto's still in Capricorn, like, you know what I mean? Like, and now that Pluto's here and the sun's here, so it's like, or if you looked at Helio, now the Earth's here and and in in Leo, and this and it's looking at the Sun at Aquarius. It's like, oh, now we're really starting to see this Pluto Aquarius. So I think it was all those things combined. Well, yeah, that's the thing that you bring. I think that makes you um, that makes you unique of your generation of astrologers because you do know the astrology astronomy so well. And it comes out in everything that you teach. And that's how you start your schools, right? That's how you start your first basic astrology schools where you go around and you learn the planets. Or when you did your Saturn masterclass, you spend all this time talking about just Saturn and the mythology around it. Because it's, it's kind of like, um, I think it is 
when we reach a certain point in human evolution that it's like these new stories appear to help us understand our world too, right? And so if you think about, well, one time they applied all of this mythology to these planets, and it still actually is meaningful to us today, but we layer that with now what we understand about Helio. Like if you don't look at it all together, which is what you do, um, in Hypergate and, and different things, right? That when you put it all together and look at it and see what things repeat or what pops out, that's where those really big messages are. Yeah, they're, they're, to me, that, that's what I feel with John D's work, especially John D and his idea of the horizon of eternity. The understanding of that that farther piece that, that we're looking for that's connecting all the dots. We call, a lot of people, we call that God and all that God's created. And, and then Helio is that next place to go to get even more of that insight. I, I do feel, though, too, like when you brought up the Saturn Master Class I did, I taught it as a medieval astrology school at the same time. Like I'm like, no outer planets. But also the old way of looking at medieval astrology of like what Saturn is doing and how everybody's Saturn in each sign is like, like, sorry, you're born with a bad Saturn. How are we going to deal with this? And use, I don't know, 10 to 20, sometimes 30 examples of historical figures to celebrities to everything and just showing like, Yes, yeah, Saturn's not happy in all these places. And why is it happy at the last, you know, six signs of the Zodiac? Like, you know, it's like, it, 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 I think it wakes kind of people up to realize, you know, I said it the other day, but I said, I, was, I actually said it with you, Natalie, last night on the show, on full disclosure. I was like, I just, I think I have a hard time because I think that people write a blank check for free will without realizing, like, they're going against what, like, already is, if you understand what's already here for you, then that's the free will to use, you know? That'd be, that'd be like just sitting in a house and, and wanting water and there's no sink in it and wanting to take a shower. And so you're forcing every way and really you're just going to be using a cup and getting water from outside and pouring it. You know, and, 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 and is that the same thing? Or maybe there was some other part that you could do in your life to make the house you know, that, that, that you're missing out on that's more important. So, so, so many people get obsessed of, over this free will idea of just like blank check, like what, to whatever I want. They don't understand the cycles or the timing or even mainly what they're born with. And I think that's the hard part for people is the acceptance. Astrology is something that's like the most difficult thing to accept, whether it's a transit, your progressions, or just your natal positions, the aspect the essential dignities, being born with Gemini risings. I mean, I don't know what I would say. <laughs> There's nothing like insulting your host. Um, mm. I actually thought about this. So anyone that hasn't watched Full Disclosure that is on High Vibe TV, you have to watch last night's episode to know what Dave and I are sort of referencing. Anyone who's not on the app, you have to get on it so that you can watch Full Disclosure because it's an awesome show. But I was thinking about this today as I was getting ready because I was just thinking about last night's conversation. And it always makes me laugh because I feel like with the manifesting conversation, we always do sit... I don't think that we're in opposite positions, but I think we, we come at it from slightly different positions and I completely understand where you're coming from. But I was contemplating my own personal charts and the reality is all of my charts whether it be numerology, um, human design, astrology, all of that, they're all very powerful charts. And they all, a lot of my transits from everything or posi natal um, positions that I've been reading, they all lead to this overly positive individual. So where, where I'm talking about transcending um, particular transits, especially ones that are tough. And my version of transcending isn't changing the outcome of it, but it's how I approach it. So that's where I take power in those situations where I go, okay, this is going to suck, but what's the best way I can navigate it to sort of cause minimal damage or minimal destruction in my life versus sitting there and throwing my hands up going, well, I'm screwed because this is a horrible 
moment in time that I have to get through. And so I think when I talk about manifesting things, I'm coming at it from a manifesto. And then with those natal positions that I have and with the numerology that I have and all of that, it leads me to kind of go in this very positive direction where I do believe I can transcend a lot of it. But I also think that my superpower is that I have an understanding of all the charts so I know how to work through all of them. And so I think I I say all this because I'm curious. So hearing my logic behind it all, am I essentially doing what you're talking about anyway, that I'm aware of what my chart is and the limitations and then just working through it? Or am I coming at it from an angle that you just go, no? No, I I, I respect your angle, but I think one of the most uh, best questions I've ever been asked, like, on a consistent basis, but it's not a lot. But as far as like, there's a lot of questions that come consistent as being an astrologer, but like one is like, well, you're an astrologer. So like, why don't you, you know, like get through stuff maybe easier. Why don't you like, I don't know. I think I've done a pretty good job because people would usually say, why don't you know how to make a million dollars? Like, well, I did do that using astrology, but like, (laughs) it's like, it's like the main one is like, I was in that position that you're talking about in 2013, 14, and 15. And my anxiety just every month for that 36 months kept escalating. I had a reading with Jeff Jower, October 31st, 2014. And he helped me a lot. And then he passed away in 2015. So it was like really, I was very lucky that he, I got a reading before he passed. And he's, he's one of the best astrologers of all time. And he, and he showed me some stuff in my chart that I didn't realize I was going through, right? And I remember, like, when this position will happen, then I'll feel it's going to go away, right? Starting to get that, that, like, and then it became to where I had, like, six things happen and it didn't go away. And my panic disorder became a agoraphobia at that point to where I wouldn't leave my house. Like, I was having panic attacks 9 to 12 hours a day. I was in the ER multiple times thinking I was being poisoned and they were just injecting out of and me and just being like, no, you're, you need to go get help. And it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, and I, and I realized it was like, we all have to find our own pattern. So for, for me, my pattern is going to be different than yours or Anne's or anybody's of where it's like, this is going to happen and it's going to be difficult. And, and, and it's, so when Jupiter comes into my 12th house, whether I was, when I was young, it made me forced to have to be not so shy and, and, and communicate in school. That one, of course, when I was so young, it really didn't affect me as much. But the first one after that was when I was in prison in the boot camp, hospital, all that shit. Uh, being in just 12th house world that was horrible. And then when I came back around again, it was in 2015. And I I literally was at my wits end. Like I was doing the videos every day. People could see my hair. It was like not up. When a double Leo has their hair down and their crowns down, there's problems. That's how you know. So I was that bad. And I remember being like, well, the only thing left is Jupiter to get and cross my ascendant. And it was when Jupiter was like a degree away and that was a very rare year because it was the Venus retrograde year and eight years ago, just how we just had a Venus retrograde from Virgo to Leo. But that, this one we just had was Leo only. It, they both conjuncted at 28 degrees and squared Saturn at, in Scorpio. And I remember being like, oh my God, thank God Jupiter's coming out, but Venus is coming back in the 12th house. And Venus didn't hurt at all, like in retrograde. It helped prepare me. I went through a five-week outpatient behavioral health, you know, for my mental health, just for four hours a day. And the whole time I remember being like, that's all I had to do is go get help and go to therapy and go to group therapy and start getting into therapy and get a good psychiatrist and have the psyche valves in those four hours a day. And I, I'll be honest, I tried everything. My journals of those times are the worst. And, and, and I think maybe it's my own personal like bitterness from it, but I'm never going to sell somebody on getting too overly positive when there's going to be 
if I see it where it's like, and I'm not just talking about Jupiter in my 12th because it was also my progressed sun leaving Leo coming into Virgo. When I start seeing like a massive progression that's once in a lifetime, a massive transit that already is, I've already called you out, like, and let's say in a reading, like, up, oh, this is happening again. This is that, right? Like, and then you're having these harder things on top that you didn't before. I'm, I'm going to offer the positivity about understanding what's happening. To me, it's the positivity of like, but the acceptance of like brutally, like you need to, you need to accept this. And it's not about whether it's positive or negative or not. It's whether or not you're ready to evolve and you're ready to look at your life. And it's always what we want to avoid and push off to the next day. And that's, that's the hard part about it is like some people I feel miss those opportunities. I don't think that just because a planet will finally be done or all those transits finally loosen up. If anything, I feel people miss evolutionary opportunities opposed to it being like, how do I get through it more positive? I feel like it's more like, are you going to evolve or you're not? Because I don't believe that everybody just evolves fully. Like, but I also feel that the irony is that when people think that I gained all this knowledge and I now am better, I changed. I said this last night and I said, you are naturally evolved if you're aware enough for it. And we, we, our egos are deeper than we think. We actually think that we evolved through a transit when the transit evolved us. And so we get like to give ourselves too much credit when really we didn't do anything. It was just whether or not we were willing to surrender or not to it and accept it. And we live in a world right now that's not built for anybody to go through evolution because society and working and the ever since the industrial revolution, there is no time to process these things. There are no, you know, like, I guess like, cause we just had a baby, Sophie and I, right? Like, you know, she wasn't working and I, it's not like with my business, I, I get like, oh yeah, you know, I can just take off six weeks or two months or three months, right? Like, like people can get, like we live in a society now where it's, maybe we should be looking at, hey, this person's going through this. There's no way to avoid this. Like they need some time off. But that's why you see so many suicides now. That's why you see so many horrible things happening to people because we're all getting it collectively, but there's some people that it's just like their charts were set up in a way for it to be the most extreme evolutionary process of their life and they have no idea. And it always comes, most people are forgetting the other, they're not seeing the other stuff. They get focused on one thing, like I'm having this transit. And it's like, yeah, but it's also affecting that planet that's squaring it or that, that planet that's opposing it or that progression that's going to cross it or whatever. And then like, oh man, like, and it's like, so it's, for me, I'm always like weighing out, like, is this serious or not right away instantly? And I go right to where it's serious. And then I gauge how intense it is. And I already know within an, you know, 20 seconds, not even like if I'm dealing with a, a 10 on the Richter scale earthquake, or if I'm dealing with a 2.0 aftershock, you know? So I don't know if that answered, but, but I think, I think the over positive thing works most of the time until you get to that, that part of that, those evolutionary, those evolutionary moments that it really actually buries you because I kept doing that. I kept writing in my journal. I kept doing it. I kept being so positive. And it, if, if anything, it brought me the opposite direction and put me, put me in a place to where I was writing in my journal. Like I feel like I was, I felt like I was going to die, but that's part of the panic attack, right? Like in the agoraphobia, like I was just like looking, I couldn't even get to my, I couldn't even like look at the sun. I couldn't even walk outside. I couldn't even be in an open space. I couldn't, and I literally just was like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I'm just going to like, and I, I've given all my positivity. I can't even go on a date to get some sort of comfort from a girl because nobody's going to go on a date with a guy who's fucking got agoraphobia in his fucking apartment. Like, and, and that was the biggest lesson of my life to teach people with astrology after 2015. Like, and especially in my readings, like, no, 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 no. I'm not here to give you this pump up. You'll be okay. like, I do say it, but I'm like, no, 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 this is going to be this long and it's going to happen. And this is where the evolution is going to take place. And it's probably the most, it's always the thing we're avoiding. 
And that's, that, that's, I think the hardest part is what we're always avoiding. It's the breakup we're avoiding. It's the help we need to get that we're avoiding. It's the, it's the job that we need to leave. That's, or the, or, or the stuff that the steps that we need to take to, to give ourselves more in ourselves and credibility, which I see a lot more of in the world than I do of people actually like, you know, I see, I think self worth is the number one biggest problem on the planet as far as what I see from 10,000 plus readings, but mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things I wanted to mention. And I think that this, that you really kind of stumbled into this, that, um, what makes, what I think makes you unique about how you do a reading is that you do know all of the mathematics, you know, the astronomy, you, you know, astrology, like it's a native language, right? It's not even a second language for you anymore. You just know it. And, the best part about what I see you doing for people, though, is that you really do use the intuition. And that's probably why Natalie and I wanted to kind of get at that aspect. Because um, I know there is probably a mathematical thing you're doing or something you're noticing in the chart. I don't know. But you just know exactly what to zone in on, right, when you look at someone's chart. And... And you always approach a reading from a place of compassion and empathy that you've been there as well. So, from I mean, I've, every time that I hear you talk about how you've done readings or if you do a reading for us while we're, you know, you'll look at one of our transits while we're sitting here, you, it comes out all the time. Even from when you talked about doing readings on the phone with people, right? That you are taking it a step above and really approaching, at it, approaching it from this place of offering something for healing, right? You really do take it as um, an aspect of being a light worker. And a lot of astrologers are just looking at the chart or the aspects. People get lost in, well, Mercury is aspecting Chiron in this way, and it means... I will be having negative thoughts or, you know, it's a square and then, or th it's just, there's so many people out there trying to do it. And that's the way you learn, I think, is by continuing to look at those aspects. But there's something you have that it's, I don't think it was learned. It's just an inborn aspect of what you do. Can I just add to that though? I think the historical knowledge that you have adds the extra layer. It's almost, it's the cherry on top. And this is what most astrologers that you see on TikTok, Instagram, that are putting their sort of short, whether it be two minute or 10 minute videos out, they they do exactly what you're talking about. They talk about the aspects and this is what it is. And you can tell it's what they've learned from doing a class or reading a book, maybe a couple of books, but they don't have the historical knowledge behind it. So I feel that your readings are powerful because you've got the knowledge about the aspects and what it all means. You have the intuition which comes in and I think goes such a long way, but then you've got the historical knowledge so you know the cycles of what goes on with that. And I think any great therapist, not that you're a therapist, but I think when you're an astrologer, you kind of are in a certain respect because you're dealing with people's personal lives and people tend to open up when they're going through a reading. And my greatest counsellor that changed my life, and I did really um, intensive therapy for five years, she wasn't the therapist that sat back and said, well, what does that mean? Or how does that make you feel? We talked like human beings and there was never an ounce of judgment because most of the things I was going through, she'd been through, or if she hadn't been through, she had a curiosity and there was zero judgment. And I feel like you, when you're speaking with people, come from a very similar space and you're not afraid to open up and share your story, which is why we're able to have the conversation like we're having today. But then you add the historical element, especially for these transits that only come around, you know, every 140 years or something like that. And you add that to it. And I think that changes it in a way that most other astrologers don't do. Well, and I, I to kind of connect what you both said, like the answer to that intuitive astrology question would be the way that a Christian connects to God through Christ, right? It's like, 
a Wi-Fi password to God, right? Like I'm not going to take the Islamic route, right? So I'm not going to Allah. I'm not going to Muhammad, right? I want to make sure if, if, if like I'm speaking as if I was a Christian, like I want to make sure that I'm going to God that way or else I'm going to hell. Well, the universe has a way of like making sure that we're accessing the divine God, the, the, the source. And it, if you think of the world today and you think of encrypted keys and, and, and how we're seeing, you know, we've the way that those keys change or like, you know, now with the second, factor author authorization, right? Like the numbers change every like, you know, 10 seconds. Right. And like, that has to be it. Like for me to dial up, I don't, I don't, I don't do the typical thing. Like, Hey, what are all the questions that you want answered in your chart? Mm -hmm. Most people know who's ever gotten a reading from me. I'm like, I'm going to answer your questions without you even saying anything. Right. Because I'm going to dial in. And the only way to dial in to get to know I'm channeling from the divine is through the astrology, because that means that it's exactly hitting exactly in that it's like, it's like a, you have access. If you're just trying to access without understanding that you're not tapping into the divine, you're tapping into your own subconscious programmed from this reality self. And there's many other environmental factors and so forth that to pop out of all that and then to connect and to actually be like, Hey, I know this is happening and this person's the charts this. And, 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 and it's weird because for me, it's not like a, I teach it in hypergate, you know, it's like a boom, 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 boom. It, it's a, it's, it's like all the passwords all at once, all the understandings all at once. And then the key unlocks to the door. And then there I am with God and able to bring it all down. And it's in a pure space because of that. And I think that's where astrologers have the one up on, a lot of people, but when you bring up now the TikTok astrologers, like the number one thing that I always see, and I, and I understand because when I was young, I used to do the same thing with Jupiter, right? Like, oh, Jupiter's coming in, like so you both are Gemini risings, right? But let's say it's about sun signs, right? And then people are saying about rising, right? It's like, oh, the second Jupiter comes in, you're gonna be good. And then they they say Jupiter, the planet of good luck and fortune. They just like. <laughs> have these, like, it's funny because it's true. Ah. Yeah. Right. So, 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 to me, Jupiter is the Jupiter doesn't pay off till the, till it leaves. It, to me, Jupiter is the balloon that does not stop being blown up, and it becomes the Hindenburg on the retrograde. <laughs> and then you're dealing with a Hindenburg oh. crisis that blew up, and and reflecting on how did it all blow up, and and the, and the and the understanding and the lessons and the adventure and the learning and the and the knowledge that you gain is after the Hindenburg falls. I'm, I'm, I'm not building another Hindenburg. Now I'm going to go about it this way. It reminds me of like how antidepressants work, like with reuptaking the serotonin, like, oh, we're going to make sure that we get the receptors to not take the serotonin and discard it. We're going to let it to where the serotonin can just keep staying in there. And if I, I, they put me on an antidepressant, one, one pill, they say that shit takes three weeks, one pill. And I was up for three days and fucking, I went to the doctor. They're like, Hey, you, you, you can't be on that shit. That shit made me fucking crazy. I was like, well, because I have too much serotonin already. Right. It was like, I was going into serotonin syndrome. I was sweating. I was fucking like, it was crazy off one. And it was a half a pill. And I, when I learned that understanding, I was like, that's so Jupiter. The, the situation that you, it's too much, too much, too much. It's, there's no stopping it. There's no, it, it's just a planet that never stops expanding. So people look at that as a good thing, but geez, where the opposite of Saturn is like, yeah, we're not expanding shit, but sometimes in life you want that. And then sometimes you want the expansion. But so there's so much, you know, misgivings giving out there now in the TikTok astrology community of just like, they use these like, simple things too. Like, oh, you're gonna have good luck with career and it, you'll probably get a good job or you'll have a good relationship or they, 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 there's, it's so simple. And that's like what I guess people want and that helps. So I'm not going to say that stop doing it, but you know, I feel like I'm just the place to where it's like, you ready to come over and like figure it out now, you know, like you, you really want to evolve. You really want to have it actually be accurate in your life and blow your mind and actually do something with it. Like opposed to just 
when, when's this happening to me? When, when do I get this? When, when, is, when is God just going to just throw me everything and I'm just going to keep asking for God and be an ego narcissist with the universe? And when, when's Jupiter going to pay me? And that's actually, I feel, where astrology took bad, bad course directions and why, like Marcus Manilius was such a great Greek astrologer and because he was in Roman because he was a poet, that astrology is poetic. And it and it's it's a poem that you were that you are the the living poem of this life, and it's about the appreciation of it and understanding of it. So you never hear me in horoscope say, "Oh, yeah, Jupiter's just giving you fortune right now." I don't say that's just like crazy town shit. It really is because sometimes you know it might be positive and exciting, but that doesn't mean that in a year it's going to go good. The situation it could if anything it's the peak of knowing oh the banana is not fully green and it's not got you know black dots all over it yet it's it, it's ripe did you eat it like okay that's great that was a nice thing it's it's a benef benefic benefics unfortunately if we lived in a benefic world we would all be so bored we would be not alive and, and it said in ancient astrology too that the malefics are here because they're brings they bring us mortality they are morbid they they are what why we get old for a reason to die they're the things that bring decay and it's the balance between those two that we have to live through and 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 nobody's giving that in that TikTok astrology world at all like they're completely devoid of it they're just using it to get a click and to get people to get them a reading where they're going to say yeah you're gonna you know, and they always say a possibility where I'm like, no, it's going to happen. You know, <laughs> do you think it's the same with the TikTok and Instagram um, tarot readers? Because, right? Because mm -hmm. there, there was this one guy that I started following, and I started following him because I enjoyed one reading that I saw, but really, I bought two decks of cards after watching him because I loved the cards that he had. I haven't watched him since, not a full video, because every single reading was, oh, he's coming back to you, my love. And then they would start shuffling. And then I noticed that every single TikTok um, tarot reader, it was all, oh, he's coming back to you. And it, everyone in the comments going, claim, claim. I claim it, he's coming back to me. And I get it. We need positive messages. Sometimes it's that that'll get us through a dark moment, just the hope or the belief that this great thing's coming. But I always watch it and think, I don't want any of my exes to come back. There is nobody in my past that I'm sitting here pining for going, come back because things end for a reason. But do you think it's the same thing with the, with the tarot readers on TikTok as well, that they've figured out, out the algorithm that if we talk about love and it's always sort of in this positive space, that that's what gets the clicks. And then, because this always comes up on the high vibe community, Deep Love Tarot, that show was such a huge success. And- uh, l Largest uh, <coughs> tarot video ever <coughs> done um, <laughs> you, <why? coughs> uh, of all time. <coughs> exactly. But part of it was, it wasn't the rose tinted glasses, although Craig would often wear them, Yes, where, <laughs> when you guys were doing the show, but the readings weren't through rose tinted glasses. You would call mm. it as it was. But, but don't you think it was, it was really popular and it was kind of existing before a lot of those TikTok, TikTok Absolutely. tarot yeah, people they weren't came around on. Yet. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like that started to become what people wanted to hear more. And then Deep Love Tarot maybe wasn't the thing they wanted to see anymore. Because I think during that lockdown time, people had a lot of time to sit and really delve into meaning and significance. I mean, it'll come back, but I think people right now are just, like you'll be in a, um, in a chat and you'll see someone jump in and say, have you gotten to Libra yet? It's always the Libras wanting to know. <laughs> well, <I laughs> and mean, then it's, it's just like, oh, yeah. is he coming back? It's, it's the things you're talking about. Yeah. That's what people want to know. That, that show was unique because it was, no order putting all the name all the signs in a random Chance. order in the gold cup 
for me to pick. So it's a true reading, right? right? If you're going in order for tarot, it's bias already. Right. Right. So that's like, you know, cause it kind of reminds me of like roulette, like, okay, we're, we're really going to let the universe pick this shit. Right. But then the other parts were I used so many cards and different decks and they were not in any way that anybody has ever done before. Right. right. Like, and then having the oracles at the end to add with on top, then using tarot and being extremely harsh and be, and then using astrology. Cause I would say the astrology, like this is the week where I did it and on every sign and I would give their solar astrology to them. And then I would look at it through the lens of that. And that's where you don't see tarot people doing, right? Mm -mm. And that's why most tarot people just, it doesn't fit. It doesn't stick. It might stick for the second because it, it's like a little like, I hate to use the expression of a candy, but it's like a nerd just like, oh, I got one little like little, but then it goes away quick. Like a little nerd, you know, like, <laughs> ooh, yay. And then oh, well, it's gone. And, 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 that, and then because it was like, no, this is not good, right? Or you know what? This is good but there's still something here. If it, it was so rare to get an actual, like, this is amazing. Right. Right. And then it was also evolutionary where I was like, you know, you're still evolving in this place. And if we all know relationships, like the idea that relationships, like I'm going to have a per perfect relationship and it's going to be good for 20 years and there's no problems for 20 years. Like, that's just crazy. Like every week's different. And so like, the, the, like, I never did it about like, who's the person coming back? I never did that. I would say somebody might come back if the right cards came up for that. And then I would ask, Is, should they? And then I'd be like, no, based off all this shit. And then I would get super specific. Like it's an ex coming back who was already fucking somebody that was your friend that was da 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 and they're fucking now thinking about this shit and they saw you know whatever i got so specific on that show and that show was hours long but it was beyond entertaining we also showed i i still don't see it people are just sitting at a desk and they might get a second camera or they don't show their face like we did it here just like this and it was like and then having craig while well, i could shuffle the decks give his insight of like hey you know da 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 there's never been anything still to this day done that way. Mm -mm. And, you know, we were, we, go look it up. There is no tarot video that's hit a million views. We're the only one that did it. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of that. But at the same time, like, that was a show to help me get people to high vibe to get it to, like, you guys want to, like, find the astrology and actually see, like, you don't need this tarot. Tarot is just a confirmation. Mm -hmm. I've always said that, like, I, 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 and, and the, and then the, the beginning of the tarot route for me, we were looked at as crazy, me and Chris Onefeather, for doing a tarot astrology show in 2012 and 2013 and 14, weekly show, God rest his soul, because nobody thought that digitally you could do tarot on a video and transfer it to somebody to actually feel it in their life. That wasn't a thought in people's mind. Right. People were still like, you need to see a tarot person in person. So we're the ones who did that. And like, you know, it's funny. It's funny because like I get talk so much shit on about my life or who I am and how I do all this shit. But it's like, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome because that's the most layered you're line. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't, you were there when it was being pushed against and there was no, go look at, go look at the dates, go find some tarot readers in 2012 on YouTube. Well, can I say, so <laughs> in, in the high vibe community chat, because we're obviously going live in a, on a whole bunch of platforms. So I'm on the high vibe community chat. James Allen is here saying deep love tarot, December 9, uh, 9 15 2019 all-time favorite show and he's quoting particular <laughs> things you said so i just wanted to bring that up because that is the impact What's that the that show had uh this is where you need to transform your energy pisces into owning your amazing frequency of your radiant vibration 
There was probably a lot more crazy shit I said, but yeah. I'm sure there is, but this is obviously <laughs> what resonated memories, yeah. for James mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. fact that, I mean, we're five years later and he's carrying that with him. Right. That's an amazing but, legacy to have. Yeah. Because tell me if a single one of these TikTokers that say, oh, my love, he's coming back to you right now or in the next week, you know, he's coming back, he's thinking about you, he's just afraid to reach out. And when I go into the comments and there's 20,000 comments and they're all saying, I claim this, 20,000 of you think that your exes are coming back? Like, I <laughs> statistically, I don't think right. that's happening. No, I mean, statistically, there's probably 20,000 of them that th- those holes are being played with, you know, by somebody else. <laughs> so, but I, I do feel that when that show was being done, if I saw it, you know, that's the thing what I don't understand about the tarot love thing. Like when I, when, when I did it, it was like, you know what? This is popping up about your work right now. Just the, like, like I, sometimes I would divert off love and be like, no, this isn't about love. This is about like, your work life now and getting this done. And, and you know, it's probably best for you to just keep focusing on that at this moment. Like, you know, but I don't hear that. I hear always they have to deliver the love thing and they have to stay in the love story. And then they, they don't know how to divert off. And that's not intuitive. That's being stuck. And then if it's just pure cards, I never did pure card readings except for on my apps, right? Where I would do the weekly tarot. But again, I would throw astrology. And so like, you know, like, 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 like the idea that you can just use tarot to find the answer is insane. Right. Why do you see so many you know, like, of, of the tarot people? Right. First of all, they go down the list of the signs, right? So, so they think, so, I mean, they are being astrological in that that's how they divide up the collective to do the readings. But then gradually over time, you'll see really good tarot readers eventually start to get into the astrology because together you can yeah. really notice trends because intuitively you're picking up certain things like the thing i will never forget about deep astro- uh, deep, deep, love, deep tarot. love tarot was south node going through sagittarius oh and, and me how, wrecking the sages every week in Sag and Rises. how mad people people were so sad about that it's funny and you they say it so upset Amy in the chat is saying as a, as a Sagittarius and she said it before you brought it up. Really? So I didn't mean to cut you off, but I love David's tough love. Sometimes See, I needed it. And people do need that. South Node's going through Libra right now. Oh, and Pluto squared my son for I don't know how long. That was a while. And I mean, Libra was not getting really lovely readings at that point for sure. And my life was really kind of crazy. Or it was going through a lot of transformation. But there was a lot good too. So why are people afraid to hear the other side of the coin? Why do they just want to hear about their twin flame coming back? Well, and that was what was funny is we didn't do twin flame no. on that. And then the reason why, like, like the Sages were hilarious to me because especially when the South Node ingressed into Sag, it was more than that though. It was like, Sag had such crazy, evol- it's about the evolutionary astrology happening and understanding that coming into the tarot reading. So it's like, before I'm going to fall for these cards, reminding you that I'm not going to be this hard on you forever. Like, you know, and like I proved that by if you follow me long enough, then it's like, you know, Sag is right now that I, I'm like fucking, fuck yeah, this is starting to finally clear in your life, especially now South Node's out of Scorpio and after all the fucking Scorpio shit and the solar eclipse in Scorpio last year and fucking, right? So Sagittarius are in a much better space than they've ever been. And if you know a Sag right now, you know, you could probably look at any Sag right now and be like, damn, you're looking better. You're, you're looking like, you know, but th- most people, and th- I think that's the hard part because it's an evolutionary astrological understanding if you're doing and that's where the tarot community it blows my mind they they use that for the signs right and then they try to act like they know the signs but they don't know the evolution like they don't know that like the eighth house ruler for leo is pisces or they don't know that the eighth house ruler for fucking gemini right is capricorn they don't know they, they don't know that they don't apply that into their fucking reading at all they have no idea what it means they don't they don't understand that the way that a sign is actually the understanding of it is based off the solar house system. So it's like, yeah, the reason why, like we'll take Gemini rising, for example, or of a Gemini sun, right? Cancer's the second house. You guys feel more comfortable when you finally know 
because a thought needs to be attached to an understanding of value and actually know what it's thinking about and have it understood. And then you face feel comfortable. But if the thoughts are fucking don't have a home and don't have a value system that's planted, then the, the thoughts are just trying to, they're going crazy. Right. So that's why, right. So that's why Gemini's usually are more comfortable at home when they feel like, Oh shit, I haven't figured it out yet or whatever until they feel confident enough that they figured it out and they have the value. Then they feel comfortable to leave the house. That's, the, that's Gemini's little one of the, you can find secrets about every sign by understanding all these things, but they, they try and be like, oh, like Leo, you're, ha, ha, you're like, you know, Mr. Superstar or something like that. When it's like, um, uh, Pluto's been in Capricorn for fucking 16 years. Leo's have been fucking like, like Virgo servants. Not really fun. <laughs> <laughs> We've been serving people and serving the community, right? Like that, that's not, but you traditionally as a Leo are, right? So like th that's, I think the hard part is like, you know, we're looking at a, we're looking at kind of like a, it, I think it adds value to people's lives. I'm not going to say stop, but it's more of one of those things. It was just like, it got, it got, I, I helped make it poppy, but with, with edge and fun and with the depth and with the truth, this kind of pop is just like regurgitate quick, get out and not leave something that actually changes somebody's life or, or actually saves their life or makes them not have to suffer so much. That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. And, and instead it's popping up popcorn to make them feel better. And, and, and when it's even a bad transit, they just keep pumping the butter, mm. just pump the butter on the fucking popcorn. And then they don't even understand how it works. Like, and that's what I think is like the sad part or where the tarot came from and why it came. And, and, and it comes from some pretty, you know, it didn't come from the Aleister Crowley. That, that's, all, that's all way later. It's, it's Renaissance time. And it, and it came from a time of, of, of people really wanting to form the understanding of like having a human divination, human understanding of to where it's relatable because to go to the ethereal from a planet and combine that into an understanding from a human aspect takes an extremely elevated translator. And so the tarot was like a quick way and it was meant for confirmation. It was never meant to be, oh, let me just do a reading on you and see what happens. That's why most people made fun of it and it lost its credibility and why it still loses its credibility today. Like how, how many times have you two, I'll ask you two a question. Have you pulled a card for yourself about something? D did it come true? I'll pull, when I pull cards for myself, a, a lot of times I'll tell people, I can't read my own cards. But yeah, it does a lot of times. If you do it all the time, you recognize the patterns. But I always notice it after the fact. <laughs> like, oh, that's why I kept pulling Seven of Swords. Right, I. But in the moment, it's like, what? Nothing's going. Nobody's lying to me right now, or nothing. There's nothing bad right now. And then afterwards, you're like, oh, yeah. So, what about you, Natalie? I hate pulling cards for myself, and I hate it because I know my ego gets in the way. If I pull a card I don't like, I have in the past gone, nope, that's not it. <laughs> and then I go, you can't do that because that goes against how this is all meant to work. I will say I pulled some cards today, but I got this amazing deck. But this is Oracle, not so much Tarot. And it's... Oh, you already know my opinion on that, yeah. Dearly departed messages. And I did it with Anne. Were, yes. were, were the cards accurate in your opinion? I'm curious. I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, mostly. I mean, except for, you know, the one card that said, meet me at my favorite place, our favorite place, or mm. where... I barely knew my grandfather who said <laughs> yeah. that to me and I don't know what our favorite place is, but it doesn't mean it didn't work. It just means I don't know. Yeah. I'll find out one day. But so I pulled the cards for uh, Bumble because it was one year ago. Tomorrow is the date where it's one year, but it was a Friday that I lost him. So it was a year ago, you know, this time last year I was in a bed crying and just not yeah. believing my reality. And the cards that I pulled, and this is quite a large deck, and there's a whole array of messages. 
those cards that I pulled today, pretty accurate. I do, um, well, incredibly accurate because they were, they were very specific messages. Tarot cards, I tend not to pull for myself at all anymore. And admittedly, I will do readings f- even for friends if they ask. I will do it. Sometimes I'm called to do it, but I actually prefer reading for strangers because then it takes all the ego out. I take whatever I'm getting, but for me, I know that I get in my own head. I yeah, don't think so, that was really a question, but. Well, yeah, no, it was a good. I, the reason why I asked the question is because it's like tarot cards are like, what's the outfit that I'm, I should be wearing today, kind of, of whatever the situation might be. The astrology is, I don't give a fuck, but Pluto's going to be posing your son for the next two years. So you walk outside and it's a fucking hailstorm. And you walked out in a fucking dress. That's tarot to me, right? Like, the, oh, oh, shit. Because like with astrology, they, no matter what you are doing, whether you're pulling anything or not, it's going to happen. It's going to show up. And you can at least gauge the exact timing and know the actual understandings, the rulerships, and use it to your advantage of life of being prepared. Like, fuck, you know what? I really want to wear this. But it's like, you know, like I'm wearing this, my, my Hugo Boss fucking, you know, peacoat right now, right? Like it's fucking cold. It's, it, and we're going to have the biggest rainstorm eight inches here, right? Like, okay, like, uh, you know, sure. I would, I wish I could have wore something else or maybe what, I, like, no, nope, it's fucking, it's, it's raining. So, you know, like, you know, no matter if the tarot card popped out and said fucking, oh, you know, nine of swords, fucking go at it, fucking look badass. Where's <laughs> where, where are my John Bravado and my velvet fucking boots today? Fuck no. <laughs> right or when i used to pull it i remember i, I, I and it was i would do it for fun because i would laugh at myself i'd be like is this person gonna call me back or something like it'd be like something and be like and then i pull another one and i pull another one and i'm like oh now, now i already know the astrology and i already know their astrology and then, you know like it's just like i know it can assist but i think it's about ending suffering in people's lives and not to put it down, but it's a confirmation for divination. It's a confirmation. So it's like, okay, I know this is happening. I've got the answer. Oh, you know, the card will always show up. So if like I'm doing a reading on somebody after like, let's say an hour reading astrologically, and I'll be like, let's just pull a card for confirmation, right? And then let's say it's about a relationship, right? And whether or not they should finally leave because it's become too long. I've already named all the dates. I've already said what's coming. It's already, I'm, you know, people will, I'll say like, you're already way bar, far behind. You've been missing the fucking train for a long time. That's why it's got so bad, right? That's when it's like death card. That's when it's, you know, it's like, do I need to keep pulling more cards? Like, like, like that, that, that's what it's meant for is a confirmation to a confirmation already that was given by the universe. So, that's how I did deep astrology. It was like, it's here to confirm based off what the astrology is saying. And, you know, that's hard because also I think that people aren't applying that understanding of the astrology with solar. Like a lot of people love to hear it now, right? Like what's my, what's my horoscope for my sun sign? But I, if I get on a reading with somebody, they're so obsessed with their rising sign and they're so obsessed with the, their houses, Right. And then this whole whole sign thing, I think is the biggest, most retarded thing in the universe because if you don't do it in your, it, okay, I'm a Leo rising. Okay, it's that, the whole sign, the fifth house is Sag, like it's basic. So if I have a Neptune and Uranus and Sag, that's fifth house, whole house. It's simple shit. It's who makes, who puts out a whole sign chart? They look like an idiot. <laughs> like they look like an idiot. We're at a time to where we have the technology and we have the life where you can put the, if you know the time and we know where it's at, we can know, boom, that's where the ascendant's at at that degree at this minute. And especially because you guys are Gemini risings, right? From Gemini all the way to Capricorn, right? That's the fastest fucking, every one hour, doesn't matter the time of year or whatever, every hour, it's going to be a new sign after that until you get to fucking cancer to Sag, that's two hours. So like right now in Aquarius season, in the mornings, it goes quick. Boom, 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 boom. And by sunset, it starts slowing down. And you can have a conversation for two hours. And you can focus on something for two hours. So that's why the sun's at fucking its detriment. 
it's more than just the understandings of the mythology and so forth, but how the astrology works is in the morning when the sun rises, Aquarius is only one hour in the ascendant. So the sun does not get to revel in the sign rising for more than an hour. And that's why Capricorn, right? Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, and Gemini's, those sun and that, it doesn't get to revel. It doesn't get its big pop. So those rising signs are difficult. And if you plan a meeting in those time periods, not going to be a good meeting. People are going to be on their phone already wanting to move to the next thing because it's just changed. And that's where these people just have no idea. You know? I, I wanted to say something and then I want to ask a question. Um, I will say that whenever I'm talking to someone and if they're asking me what they need to do and I know I'm channeling, I always tell them and then people always go, pull some cards. Okay. I will say the cards that I pull, are exa it's exactly what you said. They are just a confirmation. I always say to them, this is what the cards are saying, that essentially everything I said was right. Listen to me, don't listen to me, but I, I can't give you anything else. And I always appreciate when the cards do that, just because I sit there and go, okay, it means that my channeling abilities are actually working and that's all I need. Um, it's different when I'm doing a collective reading because then I have to sort of rely on what the cards are, are saying, even though generally there's a vibe to what the energy is going, going to be before we get into it. But that's why they call it minor arcana. Because it's minor smoke moments of like a girlfriend might call you and you might be like, here, I'll post some cards for you, honey. Yeah, it looks like it isn't going that great. Are they going to actually take that to the bank and cash that fucking check? No. That's why, like, at, let, I'll just give you an example as an astrologer, right? When I'm dealing with somebody more personal in my life and they're really asking me for advice, right? Like, I will send them four, five, six charts showing... This will never happen in your life again. By the way, we've never seen this planet here in 165 years, if it's a Neptune thing. We have never seen Pluto here in 248 years, right? Like to show you it's fucking on your Venus and Neptune's new and your progressions, which is every year that you're alive, we move the chart based off one day. You will never be at this crossroad ever again, and you have finally reached this place, whether they're progressing into a new sign, a planet, or a progressed planet is stationing, direct, retrograde, or whatever, and I have to sh send them all that shit. Like, this is a fucking serious matter. Then I'll pull the card and be like, say, look at add that. <laughs> then I'll pull out their destiny cards and be like, and you're in your fucking Saturn fucking year. And you're in your Saturn 52-day cards. And your natal Saturn is here and it's being aspected in a negative way. And, and I have to do it that way to be like, that's the cash. That's the, that's the check they'll cash. They will never cash it off tarot. Any, do you know anybody who makes serious moves in their life based off tarot? Like I'm going to divorce or I'm going to move jobs based off a of tarot reading? No. No. And if they do, it doesn't work out. So my question for you was, which is, it's back on the deep love tarot conversation. So many people have referenced, and I don't know this, so I want to know if you remember it. And then if you do, I want to hear it. The Sagittarius song. They're all dying over the Sagittarius song. Sagittarius What's Sagittarius song? song? There are people talking about, yep. There's a whole bunch of people in the um, high vibe chat saying the um, Sag song had me. I mean, you know, I, I, I was an improv when I was young. So I improv everything because that's what I feel channeling is and doing all this work, right? So I don't have a script of anything. I don't come into a reading with a script or like, uh, so I'm sure I was singing fucking a Sag song like 
during those times like oh sad you guys are fucking hanging out with your oh it was i think it was about like them fucking like holding on like they just want the money or something like that like you just want <laughs> because pluto and their second and all their fucking south node shit and fucking lying to everybody and acting like they're all fucking okay <laughs> when they're really fucking hanging out and they really got that fucking guy that they're getting money from fucking they're fucking just to fucking pay the bills but they want to show off like they oh, look at me i'm a model like you know like Whatever it was, it was probably something based around, you know, like, you know, the, like, and I know the dirty secrets of every sign. And that's where I think that's what's hard is a lot of people, even in readings, they don't want to apply sun sign, solar astrology into their horoscope, which is what I teach in my schools, right? So if your sun is in, let's say, I don't know, we'll pick a random sign, brrr, Aries, and your Saturn's in Taurus, okay? You're going to always have that self-worth issue then it's the second sign over it might be in a different house but that is always going to be something because the sun is facing it's getting ready to conjunct saturn within a month right when you were born you have to face that in your progression and maybe the moment when the progressed sun crosses saturn you might get 75 percent of that shored up but there's still gonna be that 25 percent that lingers and like they, people just do not like, oh, I don't want to hear that. But they don't even understand it either. They just think, oh, my sun sign is just this whatever thing. And they go to their rising, my rising, my rising. Because, you know, when you get into like Hellenistic astrology, for example, that shit's real. It fucking works great. It's a fucking amazing time system. The same thing with the Mahadashas and Vedic. You got to know the rising. You got to know that. But at the same token, I don't have to use that in order to get to geez right away like that's how like when i'm on all those tv shows and they go like make a prediction about justin bieber right now or blah, 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 right it's like okay yeah, i already know their chart but i just look at it once and then boom i'm already doing the progression in my head i'm already doing their solar astrology i'm already doing the transits i'm already knowing where the transits are for the next 65 100 200 years i'm already i can do the progression in my head and, blah, 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 blah. and that's what my schools were and there was only like three people that passed my test because i made them have to do it in their head and not use charts like you need to be able to figure out when's his progressed moon going to be here and when's it going to be the progressed sun and do that and when is this going to be and and tell me your thing of what's going to happen and da, 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 right and like everybody failed it because they want to go to the chart mm -hmm. it's so funny that when i was looking at um the old newspapers i saw for joan quigley's um obituary it has a picture of her with all these charts in front of her and she's calculating it in the old school style right this was a picture from like the 60s or something that they showed and well i'll give her credit because she she was she was calculating the part of fortune herself in the day formula or the night formula for stuff mm -hmm. so she would like like to have it out and print it out and she was using winstar which is michael erlewine's program and that was awesome to be able to use a dot matrix printer and print out a chart and then be able to like draw on it i draw on charts all the time for deep astrology right Right. There's something yeah. about drawing too with psychic work. I mean, that's a whole other subject, but th like that, uh, she was she was looking at also because you know that beginning of that understanding of seeing a 2D chart that actually was digital that could actually you didn't have to calculate the whole chart anymore. Like Michael Erlewine changed the world. That that for especially by the 80s, right? To have it to be like a wind star that was so cool after blue star and then wind star, it was like holy cow, like now she can start playing how she used to have to by handwriting charts but like on top of a chart and kind of like well if i do move it here because that was the old that was probably her way of like doing it mm -hmm. in the old way you know so like I'll, but i think now it's kind of like right you know like I'm, but people don't uh, even think about it now i or they don't do that step what you ask people to do because People are so reliant on the app on their phone. Just, oh, what does, um, I don't even know what CoStar say I'm doing today. Or it, it, Instead of just thinking, oh, well, the moon's in this sign and I'm this and this is where it's hitting my chart. People will still look at the app for the most simple thing, like a moon, looking at the moon. And I just feel like yeah. we have the technology now where we could look at everything we want, really. 
Yeah, you know? I, and I think the the the, the and CoStar messed up people's brains with charts because most people on CoStar don't look at the actual wheel, right? They don't look at the single wheel or even a bi wheel or even a, any kind of uni wheel or anything. They're looking at always this weird fucking thing they made up of like house one, house two, house three, house four, house five, and then like the sign and the planet that's in it. Hmm. Right? So then it's like wiring their brain and making it kind of like Legos or something into understanding like, do you understand that because let's say the risings here and the planets in the third house, it, that, that that planet is at night and that these planets are in the day or like, like, like so the, these co-star kids got messed up. But then when you look at the transits, the, they'll be giving people a horoscope and saying, you know, oh, that's going to be kind of a bad, you know, day or whatever based off a, a transit that already happened and has been separated by five, six, seven degrees. And acting like it's still affecting them. Like it's already over. Once the planet has crossed out, there might be maybe that degree or two of separation that's kind of like a an understanding, but it's more of an understanding that it's going away, whether that's a good thing going away or a bad thing going away, but it's not happening still. And that's what I think CoStar's done the worst for because they, they literally, you know, that was just a bunch of money injected and how do we just get people onto this thing and make them fucking do it? And it, it seems relative, but it's like, it, it's kind of like feeding the wrong thing and preparing somebody for what's coming up when they're still talking about what already happened and saying that it's still happening when it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've noticed about CoStar that's horrible is I'm like, they're still talking about this planet that's separated fucking three weeks ago. Sometimes they'll go into a new sign and they still put it on there. I'm like, these people are fucking ludicrous. And then they try and say, loading NASA planets. Loading, it's an API. It's already all figured out mathematically. Like as if we're searching the planets. They lie to people. We're searching, like as if, like as if CoStar has some fucking satellite going, we're, we're, doing the, we're doing the sky watch right now to check the planets. There is no such thing as that. But do you think that plays into the fact that there are all these videos that people keep coming out with now on social media where they say, you're being lied to, you know, the, whatever planet is still in Aquarius, it's still in that constellation, but yet it's already been explained that just because it appears in the sky in the constellation doesn't mean that's the sign that it's in astrologically. Right, so the coding behind that and the hard code, because it's a hard code, meaning that it's, it's, it's in there in the APIs. So like, let's say you're using a Skywatch app. They're not looking at when you're outside and actually like, oh, that's where the planet is. They already know based off all of the math of the planets and what signs it's going into, whether you're looking at it from a side reel point of view, which they're all side reel if you're looking at Skywatch stuff, it's all the math. So there was a glitch, obviously, in those things because all you had to do in the morning is go, Venus is rising in the morning. We know it's just left. When that happened, it was when Venus was still in Leo and it was coming into Virgo. And it was really simple. They were trying to say like the sun was still stuck in Virgo or something like that, right? And I'm like, no, like it's really easy to see that, you know, on the horizon, right before the sun comes up, Okay, there's Venus. You can see the stars in the background that help you understand the constellation. And then the sun's coming up right after, and that's the horizon. Like, whenever the sun is coming up at dawn, the horizon line is going to be the exact same sign that the sun is in. The exact moment that we get dawn on our phones or whatever, right? So they're retarded <laughs> because <laughs> it's impossible for it to not, oh, it's staying in the sign. How did it stay at a sign and it missed another sign when you're watching Venus rise in the morning right now as Venus is the morning star and fucking you could see that it's changing with the constellations, right? And then the sun follows right after that. Ahead. <laughs> and I put all my videos out on there and nobody listened to it. They all believe that and I can't believe that people fucking fell for that shit. I was like, this, this is where we're at they don't they don't get astrology they just want to act like they do or where's this planet right now how do you not know when where the sun's at and where a planet's at like like why can't we see mars 
because Mars retrograded last year. And fucking, so the sun has been on the other side of Mars. From, or from the Earth has been on the other side of Mars for a year. So we see Mars when it's in the retrograde year, which of course is going to be coming up this year. So we're going to see Mars again this year. It's fucking retarded that people go up there. Wait, what planet can I go see? You fucking retard. The fucking Mars <laughs> retrograded. You saw it last year. You're not going to see it. You saw it in 2022. You're not going to see it. And, and we saw it at the beginning of 2023. You're not going to see it 2023 afterward. Okay? Like you're not going to see it. You're not going to see it beginning of 2024 because it's fucking on the other side of the sun now. <laughs> because we're faster than Mars. Like, it's just like, whoa. Maybe you should make that video. You should just start I mean, doing well, this. Well, you know, Everybody, I don't, I don't trip morning, or we don't see. What, what, all these festivals I go to, I teach astrology outside. Right. And I teach them it in the middle of the night and I teach them how to read it because if all the electricity goes out or whatever, but you, you're running to an ephemeris. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I would be fine for the rest of my life because I'm just like, oh, yep, 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 yep okay, yep, 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 yep. And then you already know it's a pattern and it's a simple pattern and fucking it's easy to read at night. It's easy to see. It's easy to know. And you know, that's why we celebrate Halloween. It was the original understanding of when the sun was on the opposition to the, to the star cluster of the Pleiades, but because of the procession now, and then with the calendar system, they move that, you know, to where it's, yeah. When we're seeing Taurus above and we're seeing the Pleiades, right. And it's like the celebration that we're in the dark and we can see the light. Right. And, and people don't realize that's where it started from. And of course it's progressed over time. So really the real Halloween is the day that the sun ingresses into Sag and it opposes the Pleiades star cluster. Hmm. But people are again, putting on their costumes and then not looking up at the sky and realizing that the Halloween that we just had. Yeah. Fucking of course, fucking you could see Jupiter at night when it was retrograding, right? And, 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 and I always have that thing about Jupiter. I always tell people, like, watching Jupiter retrogrades is hell to me. That four months is the Zeppelin has come down and there is no going up. It, there's no more helium in the balloon. There's no more, you know, and, and, and so when people are telling, you know, Ju Jupiter sure is protecting you in some sort of way. If anything, I would say Jupiter protects the same way it protects our solar system from, from gra the gravitational pull that it has. But we also are watching Jupiter change colors, right? When I was young, it was, you know, pinkish, reddish. Now it's all blue, hmm. right? Like all the planets have been doing all their crazy changes. And then you don't see any astrologers, especially a TikTok astrologer, even apply any of that info. So it's not the same Jupiter that it was in the 80s. Right. Like, and, 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 and so people are, people are lost right now and they're just like throwing shit together and whatever, that's fine. But the fact that they don't understand the sky and they don't understand those basic understandings, like a chart is the best thing. I can pull up a chart. Like when Jupiter Saturn conjuncted in 2020 on December 21st, it was so easy I just was like, I was in, I was in um, Manhattan Beach or I was in Hermosa Beach, one of those. And I was in my GTR with the top down. And I fucking was like, here, watch this. Fucking, and I just pulled up a normal, just Astro gold chart. And there's the horizon. There's the descendant. And there's Jupiter Saturn in the eighth. You know, like you can just do it on the horizon line, like beep. And then you know where the planets are that way. I don't know why people use these stupid visual sky apps because... Number one, they're always moving all weird because it's not the planet actually there that the thing's, the thing's trying to use the math of knowing that it's there and just kind of throwing it in your GPS space. I want to play devil's advocate here. <laughs> Those sky maps, uh, I think I used Go Sky. It taught me about the constellations. So yeah. I never used it as an astrology thing. It was more, and it taught me more than just the... Um, the, you know, Aries and Taurus and, and those constellations, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor and um, uh, all of the other ones that are in the sky. And so now, depending obviously on what time of year it is, I can go out and say to people, that's this constellation, that's that, con that constellation. So they're very handy for that. 
And I feel like that gave me a grounding to then go into learning astrology to learn that. But I never base the astrology on what that is showing me. Yeah, that's the thing. It's separated now. We, we think of astrology and astronomy as two separate things. Mm. And I don't think there... I, I can't think of any other astrologer who's looking as much at the actual astronomy I mean, yeah, Rick Levine will talk about that, or it's sort of like the... Well, and Gemini Brett, mm -hmm. there's, some, there's some good guys out there that are doing it, and, yeah. and women. But you know what I was going to say, too, is that everything's not co-star, because what I think is interesting is how influential that you've been, David, where, especially on young men, or, you know, they were younger when they started watching you, and you got a lot of guys into astrology. When I was in high school, it was the girls who were interested in astrology, not really guys, right? Or I don't know about, about you. No, I, I, I think you're absolutely correct. And we have a good number of men that come to any of the live events that we have here. I mean, I, the numbers show is quite opposite, but... I would say that the guys I've inspired became astrologers, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. there's a lot of people using their iPads with a pen yeah. and doing it like you. Yeah, actually, Rick Levine showed me that with a with a iPad when it first came out, but then he, he didn't use it on the computer, like, you know, or, or <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, and it just came out, the new iPad with the pen, and he showed me it, and he was like, look how badass this is, and then he show me, I think, on a Microsoft Surface or something like that. And I was like, yeah, that's fucking cool. I was like, fucking, oh, I'm like, I'm going to fucking use that on fucking a show. It's fucking super easy to do. Most people still can't figure out how to do it right. <laughs> Which blows my mind. But I, I think, like, the other thing is, like, to go back to the plans for one sec is, like, and this is where it's a little harsh for people, right? Like, depending on when you're born, Planets like to be in the day and planets like to be in the night. Or like, like for the moon, for example, the moon likes to be from the bottom of the chart. It wants to be in the bottom of the chart. It does not want to be above. Even if it's exalted or if it's at home, it doesn't want to be above in the daytime. It shines to be seen at night. It's overpowered by the sun in the day. Sun doesn't like to be below. If you're born at night, you already got a hard chart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if you're born at night, you got the, it's already a hard chart, right? Or the same thing. Like, well, I, I also put it this other way. It's kind of like, you know, like, you know, like Jupiter likes to be seen, right? So Jupiter wants to be a night in an, uh, on the night part of wherever your chart is. If you have a day chart at the bottom, it wants to be in the darkness, Right? Like people, people don't apply that. I know that good astrologers do. But what's the problem in like 75% to 80% of the astrology field now are they, they, these people are not being taught any of that stuff. And then they're just going and doing readings and, and treating their Jupiter for the person as a normal Jupiter. Oh, it's in the 10th house in the day. Eh, can't see it. You know? And that's why they're not seeing it. You got to teach them how to, how for Jupiter to finally be seen. Or if they have a retrograde planet, like, have you told the person if it's ever going to come direct in their life? That's the first thing I look at on everybody's retrograde planets. It's really simple on Astro Gold. Just fucking go planetary fucking details. And then looking at the date and being like, nope, yep, not going to happen. You know, sorry. Like, like Joe Biden, for example, right? He's born Jupiter in the eighth house, right? Retrograde in fucking cancer right? His Jupiter, his, that means Jupiter went retrograde right after he was born. What he was born. Now he is a Scorpio. They can live to be 195. You know what I mean? Like they just don't die. Right. So, but the fact that Jupiter, his ascendant ruler is a Sag will never go direct ever hmm. is the reason why I've questioned his election to everything because of the fact that his Jupiter in the eighth, like he tried to be president more than anybody else ever. Mm -hmm. And obviously look at the, I always say like, if something's really aligned, then it should be working. It's not working. It never did work. 
So obviously there's questions about that and there's deeper shit underneath that. And it's, it's, it's sad. It's, it's somebody that's tried to manifest and have done crazy shit to try and get what he wants to be his, to be his, what he's always wanted or what he always wanted to be. But really what a sad way to have it like forever. And if there is going to be still a fucking America, I don't know. I do know, but I, you know, it's like <laughs> in the historical fucking things, it's going to be Joe Biden falling, Joe Biden stumbling, Joe Biden with a fucking sit here, talk, look at them and walk out. Joe Biden falling asleep. Joe Biden, like, like this is not Jupiter helping you at all. If anything, that eighth house is saying like, I'm making this very uncomfortable for you because you are hiding something. You are hiding something and it is not good. And let's not forget when he came in, South Node and Sag, Sag rising. And he's a Scorpio and then all the South Node for his presidency has been South Node here. Like this is a illusion of the South Node. It's an illusion. And then understanding that it's like, I think 108 years old, I think Jupiter stations direct for him or something like that. I know it's like a hundred and it's like, sorry, everyone, but this is not going to end well for him and not going to be remembered well because he didn't follow, like he's, he's a perfect living example of a living AI being <laughs> that wrote a blank check for his free will and forced it and accepted other people to help him get where he needed to go and is also willing to do things that are fucking beyond comprehensible to most people that are in the shadows, or he's a shadow himself, right? Of a literal shadow we're watching. That's not a real thing that it's playing out in the astrology. So it's easy to see. And I think that, that, that that's where most people don't in the astrology get there to people. Like it sucks. If I see somebody with Jupiter retrograde in their chart, and it's never going to come direct their whole life. They're not going to get that pop. And so it's about letting them know, stop trying to get the pop mm -hmm. in a certain direction. Right. Or if somebody's Mars, like two days after goes retrograde, like they're going to be somebody who came in real hot, but no, they didn't like it's this deep inner battle they have with themselves. Right. And it's going to last their whole life because Mars goes retrograde for fucking three months. It's a 90 day cycle at least, right? They're going to be fucking they're, until they're really old. Or if they're, if they're Pluto's retrograde and it's opposing their son, yeah, that Pluto ain't fucking ever coming direct, you know, like, 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 and teaching people how to understand those points is, is so crucial, but, but that's where people don't want to get into. They don't want to know. And it's kind of like the DEI thing of astrology going around now. Like, let's let's try to um, make it more equitable for everybody. Like, no, you're like, 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 sure. You know what I see the equity is or the equality is, is God blessed me with an exalted moon, a dignified Mars, a dignified sun. I'm a Leo rising with a Leo sun. That's the best you could get. But my Jupiter's retrograde fall in Capricorn. Of course. Right? I'm not going to try and... The universe already did it now. It does its natural equity. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, y y like the, so it's like the, the idea of approaching it and trying to change people and get rid of this masculine and feminine, positive, negative, and trying to approach people to be like, well, you know, trying to change a planet to being acting more masculine when it's in Capricorn, when it's feminine, right? So even a Mars exalted in, in, in Capricorn is only going to do well, not by how hard it pushes or anything, but the feminine nature that it has to embrace, not the masculine nature of Mars. But people don't want to talk about that or even the feminine mass, the feminine nature of Saturn in Capricorn. Most people don't want to talk about that. When you try to masculinize and try and, corporatize and try and do it in such a hardcore Saturn way in a masculine way. And if it's a ruled by a feminine sign, you're not, it's not going to work. You have to understand to be, 
you know, okay with failure. You have to like learn to nurture yourself still and learn to, you know, not try to maybe push so hard and try to receive a little bit more and try to understand. And, you know, but people are trying to change that right now. And that's scary to me because that's, never been done before and then that's already mixed with all these weird co-star st stuff and these tiktok people that you know we're going to be living in a world where there's like 10 percent of the astrologers left that will actually be practicing and actually making the predictions because you notice none of these people are making like predictions mm -hmm. like they'll, they'll say they made a prediction like look at this little story happened it's like no like you okay like sure like we're talking about like can you consistently predict like like, t like i told everybody this week on monday i'm like yeah the strikes from the U.S. against the Iranian thing's going to happen on Thursday when the sun and the moon exactly square. Fucking and it exactly happen at the same time today, right? I didn't hear anybody else say that out there. But it's like you should be rolling with a prediction every day. Like that's the whole thing. But that's the thing. And then that's a whole other world. That's mundane astrology. But that's where I think somebody is hurting in their astrology life if they're not doing a horoscope every day and they're doing readings and they're just doing sun sign readings only for like a week, they're never really in the astrology. They're like showing up to the whorehouse once a week and thinking that all the whores are going to love them when there's somebody at the whorehouse every day. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> I don't know what you mean, but <laughs> I do. Um, so when you're at the Conscious Life Expo, on the astrology panel, I mean, that's the thing people don't want to miss if, if they're into astrology, to be able to see all the astrologers talking about things, talking about all of these issues, not all of them, but a lot of them very seriously is one of the most interesting, fun things, don't you think? I, mean, I, I agree. I think the panel discussions are always fantastic because all of you that are up there generally have a different focus with your astrology and I love watching the debates going backwards and forwards. I always love watching you and Rick Levine bounce off each other. That's a comedy show in and of itself but I do enjoy hearing the debate between the astrologers. Well, I think, you know, coming from somebody who's made a lot of waves on that, especially against Susan Miller when she predicted in 2020 that you're going to have the best wedding of your life and, yes. in New York, um, and that 5G is amazing and all this crazy stuff. I mean, that just like ruined her credibility forever. And, uh, you know, like De Deb Silverman and, and, and me and Coyote Star were just like, what the fuck? Like that was just like, that is priceless. And it's on YouTube. I put it out on YouTube. I didn't give a fuck. It's priceless. Mm -hmm. Just her just, it just shows she's a Pisces. <laughs> so like, you know, but like, and there's good Pisces out there. Don't get me wrong, but she's just one that won't get, you know, in her New York way, like, oh, I need to have good Wi-Fi or good 5G. I live in New York. Like, is this about astrology or about you and you're fucking, you know, but coming into those things, it's, it's about, I, it's, I think it's been unspoken. I'll, I'm just going to speak out loud. We go into those things like maybe it's maybe just Rick Levine and I, and maybe that's it. But it's like, what is the little thing that we haven't put out publicly yet that we can debate? That's going to be like, Oh, this motherfucker figured, Oh, let's have it. Okay. Okay. Oh, and you, Oh, you got that. Like we got to one up ourselves to advance the astrology community and each other. And I look forward to hearing what, another astrologer is going to say that I hope they try to one up me. I'm coming in there with stuff that I'm going to be like, Oh yeah, let's talk about this. Oh, what? You know, like, <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, but you understand, you know, like that's the whole unspoken thing behind it all. And it's not about trying to prove somebody wrong or anything. It's about all of us advancing each other and advancing the collective together, which is what I really like. And then having some interesting debates, but I think it might get a little bit contentious because I'm really upset being an American and having a family that helped build this country and having a family that came on the Mayflower, this equity DEI and advancing that into the astrology agenda is the opposite of equality. It's the opposite of what the freedoms for equality is. And it's, you know, 
we're in the same transit of the segregation and the slavery that happened in the 1850s into right before 1860. And people just like, especially in the South, were just like kowtowing the same ideals. And, and, and the fact that there's astrologers out there and they're presenting presentations about it and doing it like that way, and then promoting, you know, for people to be locked down and, and promoting, especially in the astrology community, like you need to still go get tested to go to Norwalk right now when those tests don't even work half the time and you could, I could put that shit underneath a, I could put a test fucking under a fucking banana and it's going to pop positive. And you're telling me that I can't go as an astrologer in there because you guys are also fucking scared of COVID and you guys bought all that. And then you sold everybody on an experiment in the year of Saturn square Uranus and Jupiter square Uranus. And you, and you're trying to tell me like, Oh, like you're a bad person. Like, excuse me. Cause, because I'm not going to change the astrology that nobody's changed it. Nobody's going to change the foundation. You don't change the foundation of math. You don't change the foundation of nature. And we have an, we have a trans astrology community. And I'm not talking about the sexual. I'm talking about a trans human astrological community now that wants to, as astrologers, they are the head of it. And that's their base to get money. So they've lost all their regular clients. So they're only left with the people in that movement now. And so they're willing to kowtow it and change astrology in order to just keep readings and, and, and clicks coming for them because they're not going to get readings from anybody else. Be, and, and so they're willing to change it into a way that you, you're, you're going off completely the whole basis of the whole entire divination structure, period, which means that it's not based in divination at all. It's, it's completely starting to, you know, go off the rails. And, and, and so, you know, I'm not going to be afraid to bring that up, but you know what? I might get censored. I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. I might get, you know, again, labeled and have another Reddit made about me, but whatever. Do you, each time you talk about how they keep trying to bring this whole DEI thing into astrology, it makes me think about going back to earlier in our conversation you know, pulling cards for yourself and then going, no, don't like that card, don't like that card, don't like that card. And it becomes programming versus the message that it's actually meant to be. Yeah, so I'll give an example, right? Why on the astrology panel, if, if I were to look at all the charts of everybody, there's not enough of every sign represented. If there's only going to be six of us up there, there's six signs missing. Or maybe if there's two of the same sign, now there's seven signs missing, or right? right? So mm -hmm. that's the same idea, right? Like, oh, there's not enough Gemini risings represented here with also moons and da da da. I mean, like, now it just starts getting into crazy town. But taking away the idea, like, why is Rick Levine on that panel and I'm on that panel? Oh, he's an exalted son in Aries with a moon in Cancer. So he's got an exalted son and a dignified moon. Oh, the Leo King's up there. Dignified sun, exalted moon. The two best sun moons to have is Rick Levine and David Palmer, the Leo King. And of course, that's why we're on that panel. It's not diversity, right? right? We, the universe gets us there. Not... Because, oh, Sam Reynolds wants people to change things up and fucking make everybody do that because that's his only way to get people. Like, it's just really sad. And, and, and kowtowing fucking all these crazy fucking... Unfortunately, like, you know, what we've seen over the COVID thing, which I predicted and which I warned about, they acted like nothing was happening and kowtowed whatever the media said and didn't use the astrology. And... Like Stephen Forrest blocked me when I called him out. I'm like, why are you as an astrologer promoting people to take a fucking experiment? I don't promote people to take food or I don't tell, I don't people tell people they need to go drink Sprite, right? Let alone push a fucking medical product that's an experiment that the astrology says is going to be horrible and shatter everybody's reality. It ain't going to work and it's going to cause problems. And they all did. And when I hit him up, like, you're the world's evolutionary astrologer that everybody says, yet that guy doesn't understand evolution at all. And that guy might have killed so many people 
And nobody wants to call them, and I call them out, but nobody wants, nobody wants to ask that question. Why did the Astro Twins say, yeah, Virgo, this is a great week to go get your COVID shot? How many Virgos did they kill? Because when, what, what I've predicted and when all that info, which is already coming out in massive, we already know about the access test. We already see all the published papers now. It's like, we're at that last moment to where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, oops, they finally admitted all, which they already are in the UK. They already are everywhere else in the world. It's already admitted in the public journals. That's why you see 6% of the people taking it anymore. It's already at that place. But when is somebody going to be like, you fucking promoted something that kills people and didn't use the astrology and use that to make money off of it? Knowing Saturn and Pluto were conjuncting in Capricorn, that it was dark, fucking controlled, planned destruction the same way AIDS was? They're not going to like me on the panels here. So would there have been something in the astrology also that said astrologers will divert from their message this year or during this transit or light workers in general say that one again I'm dumb was around. there something in the transit that would that said that warned people your experts are not going to be in their right mind they're not going to be looking at the astrology they're going to be deluding themselves and not giving you good advice well i mean i don't know if you remember in my Pre, my 2020 uh, survival guide, mm -hmm. three-hour video, I was warning with this Saturn-Pluto transit that came in 2020 that was going to come and all that stuff, and I was screaming on deep astrology, right? Like, nobody wants to talk about <laughs> plagues, right? At least I have all the receipts, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I was, uh, nobody was thinking about a fucking plague. Everybody's like, what is this guy talking about? Whenever you right? say that, David, I, I yeah. visual, I remember... <laughs> sitting over there, <laughs> hearing it echoing through this building. <laughs> That's, for me, the memory is, is like not only you saying it, but just the whole... The whole 13,000 square feet fucking, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about plagues, just like that. <laughs> Fuck, you know what I mean? And that's in August and July of 2019, and then, of course, in 2017 and all that. But long story short was I was, war I was warning people, like, there's going to be a bunch of people saying, you must do this. And if they, if anybody, so it was more than just anybody of some sort of like getting advice from, but your family, a friend, a person on the street, didn't matter. I made it like anybody who's trying to force you to do something that's a, you must do this or else is a liar and caught up in the fucking whole dark game. They don't even realize it or they are it and they are fucking caught up. I fucking have the receipts. So I said that, right? Multiple times. So it was really easy to see that also as an astrologer, that was my debate with Stephen Forrest, but she didn't even want to have the debate. And then he fucking claimed I was fucking, he like cried like a little baby, like as if I was offending him. I was trying to have a astrological, like positive debate to also like question like, what are you doing? And Saturn square Uranus. So that's experiments Uranus and Taurus square Saturn and Aquarius to the people going bad. It's not going to go good. The plan is not going to work. It's going to be diverted. And it's also foreign and weird, crazy weird shit with Jupiter and Saturn that were squaring Uranus. Like this collective idea is with Uranus and Taurus going to be like, no, uh, we shouldn't be changing the foundation of people's DNA. <laughs> like, you know, it's not going to work out. It's going to be a shadow reality. It's why I called shadow reality. I put the cigarette out, fucking wore the bandana to show people like, I'm not following that shit because I'm telling you the astrology says if you follow it, you're walking into a fucking purgatory, which then I did purgatory. So it was very clear and very easy to see in the astrology. The fact that these astrologers will never own up to what they did and what they pushed on people and that the fact that they couldn't predict it and still act like they're fucking astrologers and want to get rid of prediction. In 2018, they wanted to get rid of prediction, especially when I was doing all those big tours and all that shit. At the same UAC I was at that they tried to fucking not have me at, which I ended up getting in there and I had to spend the most money to get the biggest booth to do it. They had a fucking panel. You can look it up on YouTube. United Astrology Conference, what do we do about predictions in astrology? 
and they want to shut down astrologers making predictions. They think it's unethical. They think it's dangerous. Hmm. And you know what? All those people in that room, Chris Brennan, Sam Reynolds, Stephen Forrest, Rick Levine. Why are they having a debate whether we should have predictions or not? Go why look at it. It's online. And have... I was there and I didn't go into that thing because I was like, if mm -hmm. I go in there, I'm going to fucking scream at the top of my lungs and be like, you guys are fucking insane. Mm -hmm. You guys are insane. You guys are insane because you guys suck at predicting. Like in 2012, when I was there with Michael Orlewine, I got asked by the news, right, to be on. And then David Rayleigh, who was the head of UAC at the time, he got asked about like, what's, like it was a stupid prediction. Like what's up with the saints? Are they going to win the, <laughs> right? And he just went, well, they're a Capricorn. So they need to really right now take their time and really think about what they're going to do. Like, like the, he didn't even make a prediction, right? <laughs> um, and she specifically asked about Drew Brees and the saints, right? He didn't even, and he goes, well, he's a Capricorn. So he needs to really, you know, and it was just like, I think that pissed a lot of astrology off that this random guy shows up and he's fucking on the fucking news for the whole conference, working with Mike Erlewine, right? And Michael's on there and we're talking the spiritual astrology. And then I come out doing massive predictions for all these years and all this shit and they don't get any of them right. No, they don't ever get predictions right ever, right? So they don't get them right. It was just recently that the astrology podcast started saying history is important for astrology. Just in the last month. Yeah. I don't know if you saw that, Anne, but I was no, laughing I know, my ass off. I know. Off. I, I've seen it. See, now I'm having a... Um, the thing is that I agree, right? It is. And it's a good thing that they're saying that. A little late. But they're so... What from a, As a historian looking at it, they make a lot of generalizations about history and they don't go in depth. It's, it's astrologers talking about history. They need a historian. I know. <laughs> but exactly. I mean, exactly. but I'm saying that that's what, that's what you're, what you do is that it, you know, I wouldn't put together a podcast and get a historian friend over and we're going to talk about astrology, you know, and, and history is not just, Oh, the industrial revolution happened and the French revolution happened. It's, it's all of the pieces fitting together, yeah. right? And that's, that's what astrology is as well. And so I'm glad that they do it, but I'm tired of seeing the same video over and over again. But you know who doesn't do it is um, like Pam Gregory will talk about history sometimes. And, and then she is more complex about what, what she, she really gets in and talks about it and really focuses also on the astrological transit she's talking about. But the emphasis is still astrology, you know, but. Well, well, my whole point was like, they just made that like a, if you didn't know, it's important. Right. Like in 2024, you didn't use that for what you told everybody over the last four years. You didn't make that a big point to understand what was going on. Like, it was pretty easy to see, like, these are transits that haven't happened in 800 years. These are transits that haven't happened in our lives. These are transits that are, the, every transit that's been happening over the last four years have been never seen before by any human that we could even relate to. So we can only relate to people super far back to the Renaissance or to the 1200s or even farther back that you and I've gone even far back. Or I've even gone to Paul the Apostle, the, the, the Mars transits with the Saturn thing that happened in 2020. Like, people are... That was how the predictions are made. Like the fact that they're just now acting like, yeah, we know, yeah, we, we're doing it now. Right, but it makes sense I'm now like, why they, they don't go into detail. If, they're, if they don't want to do predictions, then it makes sense. If they're, if they're avoiding predictions and they're just looking at, oh, isn't it curious that every time this happens, this happens, huh? Well, you know, you know why that whole thing happened at UAC? Because the astrology, 99% of them got the 2016 election wrong. They all said... Oh. Hillary was going to win, right? And that's why they had the debate because it made them look bad in the media and the press. Well, that was going to be my right? question. Do they think that predictions are dangerous because they can't predict anything? Well, they, they, they predict based off their own 
right? So like, and people still don't watch my election video that I did in 2020. I did two of them. I did my pre where I said, I don't even want to make a prediction because this astrology says this is not going to be a normal fucking uh, election. And it's not even going to be an election that's going to even turn out what's normal, right? So they always forget that. And then I said, if I had to pick the old school way, knowing the astrology is not going to turn out any way that it's going to be, I'll pick Trump and he's going to win the same, that night he's going to be the winner. The night of the election, he's going to win, which is what happened. And then, oh, they changed it, at the, you know what I mean? But the funny part is in 2016, I got so much flack by being the one who was like, Trump's going to win, Trump, 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 Trump and going out and getting some media attention from it. And then especially when I went on Astrology Hub, they were so scared for me to fucking be out there and be like, yeah, it's going to be Trump. They were so scared about putting that out. And then that whole thing started because they all failed and they looked bad in the media and they don't want Astrology to look bad anymore. Well, that whole, that whole room is the one that makes it look bad. They've been wrong, right? They were wrong about COVID and now they're, creating their own cult of astrology where it's like, it's cool to be an astrologer and still test in 2024 people to come in with a test that never worked. Mm -hmm. Like they don't even look at the fact of that. So how do they look at the fact of the astrology? Well, it's become more you like know? a religion than, than ever because a religion holds fast to its dogma and its beliefs over whatever you experience or see in the world that you're living in right now. You have to believe in, something else that's you know the ast astrologers who won't make predictions or who are making predictions that are wrong because they want they're hoping instead of predicting right they're not looking at the math or making an honest assessment it's more like well we believe it would be nicer to be like this yeah, or like with the DAI thing, maybe an astrologer's not ready to be at the place that they're at, but then they're getting forced or getting the opportunity because of their color of their skin or their sexual preference that's throwing them into a position that actually, if we're going to use their debate about prediction, is going to make it look even worse. The same way we've been seeing the DAI of like, oh, just because their sexual preference is one way, they should be the press secretary. Obviously, she's been the biggest liar of all time, most Pinocchios, and not truthful to the American people. Like, so, you want to apply that in astrology now, somebody might not be ready. But forcing it, and then backing anybody who's good, it doesn't matter, because astrology is about oneness. Spirituality is about oneness. So, DEI, to me, is the biggest, like, darkest thing that's ever happened to God and to oneness. And especially if you use John D, it's all about oneness. All the planets fit into each other in a hieroglyphic monad. DEI, when you're picking and choosing what you want, does not. It's your own ego as the humans picking the oneness, not the divine. It's funny you say that because the whole time you were speaking, when there was a break, I was go going to say with these predictions, is it as simple as these people are in their ego? Hence why I don't like pulling cards for myself because I know I'm in my ego. And if you're not aware of it or you're set on an outcome, you can't get past that. So for anyone that's coming along to Conscious Life Expo, is it the LAX Hilton? Yes. Okay, so that's where it's all happening. And we have you in, you're doing the panel, but you're also doing a talk. And last year there was Two so many- talks. Okay, so on the Sunday, is it one? And then you're doing a separate talk on the Monday? Yeah, yeah. so well, Friday night, I'm doing the rabbit hole DJ party 10 to, there is no time limit. Saturday, 10 p.m. again, the rabbit hole, the DJ party, all night, whenever, right? Sunday, the panel, I forgot the time. I think it's 4 or 3 p.m. And then my talk's at 8 p.m. And it's just me and Bashar closing it on Sunday. So you pick Bashar, you pick me. And you're in the big room because last year um, there were so many people that very quickly they had to shut the doors. So you're in one of the big rooms. If you're someone that missed out last year, there is space. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I, 
I was just at Disclosure Fest and it was Bashar and me again. Or last year, guess who it was again next door to me? It was Bashar and me. So they, I guess the spiritual community likes to always, or in 2013 at Lightning in a Bottle, Bashar the Leo King. So, you know, like, okay, like the universe obviously wants Bashar and me to be the option at the same time all the time. And, you know, are people ready to like go get the info that's actually like got the backing? Nothing against him. He helps. But that's like... The same thing. It's not revolutionary anymore. It's not, it's not, it's not advancing. Like, what's going to happen when we find Planet X? Right? And actually using the astrology instead of listening to some channeled fucking alien supposedly fucking give their fucking things. And are they using astrology or do they even, does they, do they even understand it? And is it really good? Is it coming from a good place? Is it like we're at that place in life where I don't, I don't think right now, like we should be fucking just like making our fucking decisions based off that. I mean, I think if you're looking for like some self-awareness issues that you're having yourself, that's where he's great at. But I think when it comes to these, we're at a time where it's like the issues are way bigger and, 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 and I'm sorry, but I don't know if I'm going to trust a guy who's really cold in person. Right. So you've had a chance to meet him. Yeah. Like that, that, you know, but, but, you know, can only do it with his eyes closed, channeling an alien. And then, at the same time, like, are we going to make our decisions based off that or actually using what's been around for every age, thousands and thousands and thousands of years that's gotten us through and survived and stayed? You know, I, I, I don't think George Washington was channeling a fucking alien. I don't think especially Benjamin Franklin wasn't as he was using astrology and making his, all, his farmer's almanacs for people. You know, I, I, I think that, you know, like it's time for people to really like start to get into the deeper realms now of what we can actually do and what 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 is the astrology saying and more importantly what are we going to do like that's my big prediction is planet x is going to be found and it's going to represent what we've been feeling this crazy shit about and how is that going to affect you in your chart and and i'll just put it here i'm going to show and predict where i feel the sign is that it's going to be found in too this is the talk at... On Sunday, yeah. Because, like, if you think about Chiron, right, it was found in 1977, and it was after its conjunction with Saturn that they were looking at Saturn, and that's how they found Chiron finally, right? Because of the orbit of Chiron from Saturn to Uranus, right? So we also have to talk about to people that the understanding with Chiron is heading towards Uranus now. That's a whole different vibe than when it's with Saturn. So we're all born with, you know, if you look at your chart, your Chiron's in opposition to Uranus, right? Okay. We're moving into a world where in this next 20 years of Pluto Aquarius, it's Chiron going to be conjuncting Uranus and Leo. So that's where Chiron goes beyond the orbit of Uranus. It has a little bit farther orbit to where humanity can unlock and see beyond where we ever have before. And, and so, like, at least I can give you the date when it's going to happen. At least I can give people the understandings of where this is going to go and how important it is and what, how to get through this next 20 years and how to get through this year and the weird shit that's going to happen. Are you going to get that from the other side? It's going to be like, oh, it don't matter. Just, you know, da, 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 da. Like, that to me feels a little bit like there's, I'm not saying it's bad, but there is kind of like a question now. Like, is that good for people to just be like, oh, no, like, just transcend it? You know, like, are you going to transcend your best friend fucking, you know, doing drugs? No, I just lost my best friend to fucking ODing on heroin this le with it less than a year. Am I supposed to just transcend watching that happen? That, that's the, you know, and so, I, I, I and I'm saying this because, like, it was sad because like people wrote on Conscious Life Expo, like, why do you always put the Leo King next to Bashar? I'm going to go to Bashar because I like channeling, but I want to listen to Leo King, you know? And I'm like, why are you going to that when you could be going to fucking where it's always expanding and predicting and showing the future of actually what's going to happen? 
And, you know, it, that blows my mind that people are more interested in the candy. Again, whether it's an alien channeled person or a fucking tarot reading on TikTok. Like, and then on mon Monday, my post-conference lecture is a big one about all of the secrets of how uh, I do mundane astrology, which is prediction and so forth and horoscopes that affect everybody, but the whole journey of how it happens and how to actually embed it into your life and so much more. And that one's for those people who really want to understand the whole system of how to be a mundane astrologer in this extraordinary time to actually better the world that we all as a collective have to start understanding a mundane world that, that is connected to a divine astrology. But people are, again, what do they want to go? I want to go watch a, a channel or that because that's like mystical to them in a weird way when really, when, are you going to do that with Neptune, Saturn, and Pisces? Like, that's like being like, I want to do fentanyl right now. It's cool. It's in. That's how I look at the, the uh, people like, I'm channeling the, the, the fucking Palladians and that's why I stopped channel, channeling the Palladians because they told me like, you already got all the info, give it out and use the astrology and do it all. Like, they, I just like, they might come through once in a while, but they are not fucking, like there's people who are like, you have to go through me to get to the fucking, to the Federation. You, you, only through me. I'm like, do you think you're Christ now? Only through me, you get to the fucking God. That, that's the shit that I'm like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried that that's where, especially, yeah, anyway. So. Well, so much ego in a community that, like you said, is meant to be oneness, where we all come together and there's this sharing of information. Anne and I, when we were talking about putting this show together, we thought that we would end every show with the same four questions for everybody. So Anne's going to kick off with number one. This is such a great question for what we've been talking about. <laughs> Here's a transition for you. What makes you laugh? <laughs> Stephen Hawking fucking <laughs> going to, that finding out that too. Stephen Hawking was at Epstein Island and they got midgets for him to do complex problems and that's how he got off. <laughs> like that is the most, it, that shit makes me laugh. You guys know I roll on the floor about it. It's just like, <laughs> I, I, I really love like the most crude humor. Like I can't do the 25 year old Netflix girl who's like, oh my gosh. So like I was in college and then like I got drunk one night. Like I, that, <laughs> that doesn't do it for me. And I feel like I need like really hardcore, really crass. And, and even if it goes be, I, it, it needs to push beyond a boundary. That's like where people are like, that might be a little fucked up. That makes me laugh. But also the positive things that make me laugh for my daughter um, with her two little teeth right now and the way she smiles and the way she like laughs because she loves my, my goatee, so she, my beard. So she just puts her hand, she just laughs and laughs and laughs. And, just, she, and, she, and Sophia is just like, that's daddy, mommy and me, we don't have that, you know? So, I, you know, I could be that warm, bubbly, fun laughter all the way to... I, 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 to be honest, I laugh at all the fucking shit against liberals. Like, like the liberals don't have memes. They don't know how to meme because they're so fucking lost in their DEI and their fucking blockers and fucking changing their hair color and fucking taking a shot that they forgot about laughter. They forgot about being funny. They forgot about, they forgot about life and living in their heart. They're so protected about trying to like force everybody to like them that you don't force anybody in life you can tell somebody's forcing because they don't know how to laugh. They don't know how to make jokes. They don't know how to, that, like, like they're trying to force something else. You know, somebody who's comfortable in themselves can laugh at anything. And, and, and you don't see most people laughing. Most people are like, <laughs> you know, that's unfortunately what Stephen Hawking wasn't doing when he was getting off. He was like, eh. <laughs> you know, so. Okay, so who was your biggest spiritual influence? Um, well, I mean, I, like there was, there was definitely Christopher Wateki, astrologically wise, and finding him on YouTube. And it was from a Capricorn friend of mine, Amy, who I just moved, my girlfriend and I just broke up and my brother and I moved in and I, it was on my computer, you know, and it was like, 
watch this YouTube video. And I'm the per- kind of person who's like, no, I don't want to see what you're showing me. At that time in my life, I was like, I, I, especially Amy, I was like, nah. But she showed me and I'm like, oh shit, you know? And um, before, before Chris, Eckhart Tolle uh, was a big influence on me. Like when I read Power Now, really shifted me with consciousness. But uh, Barbara Marciak with Bringers of the Dawn. So I'd say those three. Oh, it's mine next. It is. Um, what would your advice be to people on how to transcend fear? Mm-hmm. Go into it. I mean, we're always going to, there's nobody that's perfect at going through fear, right? So, so anybody trying to say, like, I go through fear better than you, like, I have things I'm afraid of right now. Like, I'm afraid of planes still. I'm afraid of fucking going to the dentist and fixing my teeth again. Like, but, you know, the, the more that we wait, the more we miss out on and, and the more that it feels better on the other side. Fear is the ultimate best feeling when you face it. Like, the exit of the fear and getting through whatever it is is, like, better than any positive drug feeling there ever is in the world. So, you know, and a lot of it is like, why is the fear coming up? Usually there's something underlying that you have to look at. So, you know, like it's not just the thing that you're afraid of. It's the thing that's hiding, that's causing you to be afraid of something that you're not willing to face, you know. And the final question, what's the best piece of spiritual advice you've ever been given? Hmm. That one's a hard one because I feel like it's been by so many people and the little things that all come together. Right. But I would say that it's the astrology itself and God that has been the best spiritual advice I've ever been given because by following that fully and not following the way we're told to live. And I'll be honest, the best spiritual advice I was ever given him, he didn't even know he was doing it was my friend who passed away this last year, Matt, uh, Matt uh, Tatum, when he fucking, squirted seven hits of acid in my mouth at Coachella 2006. <laughs> was it like, putting the acid in that was the spiritual advice in yeah, terms of the journey you went yeah, on? Yeah, like fucking like, I mean, he didn't force it on me, right? He was just like, hey, uh, you know, like I knew that he had acid and he, you know, we, I was like, you know what? Like I'm, 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 I'm down, I'm ready to do it. And he was like, yeah, I think it's going to fucking be like a badass you're like let love it and um after that many times of course and all that like they watched me and like uh, like i got here because of him and my other friends doug and marcus who's passed away too unfortunately i've had a lot of my best friends pass away but i did all this like it was a friend thing to be like hey guys i can i can go out there and do what our dream is you know like and tried to make opportunities for them to to have those same experiences, to experience it or become it too, like, you know, and um, so it was, it was that core group of my best friends that was like the most spiritual teachers of my life, like of, of laughter and fun and music and staying up all night and watching fucking the weirdest shit and laughing and smoking cigarettes at eight in the morning on acid fucking after the fucking wherever crazy event we went to or whatever situation happened and just fucking like loving the universe and life and just fucking, you know, I miss those days more than any other time in my life. Like as far as miss whenever you think of what you miss in life, you know? And then I would say that my dad like always was like, just fucking do what you want. Like he was the, one who supported me the most when it came to becoming an astrologer, which was kind of surprising because since he's, you know, not like super spiritual, but he was like, that shit's badass. Like it's like, do you like fucking, uh, you know, uh, even my mom admitted at the time, you know, she's a mom though. So she's like, you know, 
how are you going to make it being an astrologer? And she was worried about me already being in TV all the time and getting all the bad press and all that shit. And Jimmy Kimmel fucking talking shit on me. Right. So, you know, like I could understand as a mom being like concerned and that's when the economy was horrible too. Right. 2009 and 10, like, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go for my dreams and be a DJ mom. that's popping ecstasy and do fucking astrology. Like, <laughs> And my dad being like, fuck, yeah, fucking high-fiving me, you know what I mean? So, And, and my dad always asked me, like, because he never did take acid. He always asked me, what was the experience, if you can give me it in one line? And I said, it, it pops the lid off your shit, pops. So he would say that to people for, you know, he died in 2021. For that, like, 11 years straight, he would tell it at the Porsche dealers or everything. He'd tell, he'd like, pop the lid off my shit. And they'd be like, what does that mean? <laughs> You know, but he understood as an Aquarius. Like, I'm like, it just popped the lid off my shit. Like, I was able to fucking escape out of this program fucking bullshit of life and rewrite every fucking program myself from my soul. To be honest, the most spiritual experience of my life was doing acid and breaking the matrix. Like, to, to actually feel your real soul and not have the program on it and to be in that place where you don't even know, but I have the pictures, of course. Like, where your, your smile is so it's the most authentic version of you and you rewriting all of the reality. So that's why I look at reality so different because I broke out, right? Like doing acid breaks you out. Like that's why Timothy, I would say, you know what, spiritually wise, the top person of my whole life. And I'm not trying to put down Chris Tucky because I, I'll put him on the same level because Chris Tucky's definitely there. But Timothy Leary, hands down. Like that guy I wish he was here for all the shit that went down in the last four years. Because he would have been the only common sense thing. Even, even all these people we see on podcasts and shit like that, like they, don't, they still don't get it. They still don't get it. They won't even look at this, right? They won't even look at the spiritual aspect of it all. They just call it like dark light shit. If anybody kind of does, it's Alex Jones. But then, you know, he doesn't have people on there except a Q shaman. Who, I'm sorry to say that guy's fucking like watch some YouTube videos and thinks he's embodied it and got some tattoos, but Timothy Leary, for sure. That guy, that guy is a, that guy, that guy is, is beyond mist in this world. And I think he, he laid the tracks that, are, I mean, that guy had public debates with, with the top heads of, of, of thought and, and ideology and, 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 shut him down especially about he, he was a capitalist and a american he was not a hippie that was a, against the america basis he was trying to say that people were living the american basis the wrong way the fact that you come in my home and tell me what i need to ingest tell me how i need to raise my kid tell us that we can't fucking congregate and, and have our own fucking house up in Millbrook and fucking experiment and do fucking like if you, and that's why like even with the shot thing, if you pee, if you want to go take the shot and experiment, that's up to you. Right. Like that, that's America. Right. Like, but the fact that, you know, you were lied to about it. We're like, you know, they lied to the public and Timothy Leary did the best thing about it. Like, when they were lying and saying everybody's committing suicide doing it. Like if you look at the numbers, it's like, again, that's a lot. It was a lot. It was like fucking the smallest amount of people. It wasn't even close to as many doses that have been administered. How I many billions of a billion people have taken in a millions and how many people have died is like in the fucking like hundred. It, it's really sad. So. Well, David, thank you so much for, joining us on the very first episode of Gemini Rising. Thank you for having this conversation and hosting us here at the High Vibe Studio. Uh, so anybody watching this on YouTube that's not already a part of the High Vibe TV community, make sure you get on that. We'll have the link in the description below. And I would especially like to thank my co-host, Dr. Ann Woolkey. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. I just love that we're doing this together because this is this is what Anne and I like all the time, just sitting around <laughs> filled with so many questions and um, make sure you are following the Gemini Rising show on Instagram because that is where you'll see when our next show is, what incredible guests we have coming up. 
So to everyone that's joined us for the live, thank you so much and we will see you very soon.